this is The Extra Sheep, the unofficial Age Empires 4 podcast. The only one, too, I think. Hosted by myself, Socraton, along with Beal and Sir Nevels. How are we doing today, guys? Doing good. Doing good. Another fine day, sir. Another fine day. Yeah, happy Easter to everybody. Uh, we're recording this on Sunday. For everyone listening, it'll be probably like Tuesday, Monday, or, or later. Uh, pretty rainy one here up in uh, the Pacific Northwest for me. I hope it's uh, better weather for you guys. Uh, but today, it's pretty nice. Out here, pretty nice. All right. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Now I got the window cracked, got the front it's, it's good. Our spring hasn't really hit yet. Everything's the cherry blossoms are blooming, but that's about the only sign that it's uh, getting towards the warmer months. We're still in the, the depths of rain and cold. Uh, but we have a good one here for you today, guys. Today, we're going to be talking about maps and the current map pool. We had the new patch come out. We'll be talking about that in just a second. But we're going to be discussing today our favorite and least favorite maps. And we'll also discuss what we think makes a good map and all that and more. But first, I think we should take a look at that new patch. We have some Age Empire 4 news for you today. And uh, on top of that, it's just the new patch. That's that's the big one, I think. Um, it kind of slim patch i think i think i can say it's been slim uh but i think it's a decent one i don't think it's nothing there's not like it's a nothing burger there's definitely something to this one uh this is patch 6.1.130 uh and there's quite a bit of things to note in this i think the most chief that i the chief among these that i saw was that uh trebuchets got a little bit reworked i think um and a couple other civ specific ones as well i'm looking through here I will talk about the Trebs in just a second, but Network of Citadels took a pretty hefty nerf. I know some people have been kind of discounting this, uh, but the new price for the Network of Citadels, it, it almost doubled in price. It went from 75 stone and 200 gold to 150 stone and 350 gold. Now that stone number, I think, is the real tricky one because 75 stone, you can get that pretty quickly, but 150 stone is no laughing matter. Plus the gold increase that I noticed uh, just casting low ELO legends yesterday that uh, I kept kind of I was an English mirror that kind of broke my brain because it's just such a slog to watch. But they didn't pick this tech up, both of them, for a lot longer than I felt was comfortable for English. So I think it's a big, a bigger nerf than I was expecting at first. What do you guys think about these? Yeah, I I was playing the uh, other day. I know the network of Citadel's change has definitely snuck up on me uh, trying to research it in a game this week and realizing I just didn't have enough stone uh, getting caught out by the by the nerf uh, but I don't think it's I don't think it's a terrible thing it was a really cheap tech for what it did um, even though like its effect has also been nerfed recently um, I still think this nerf doesn't completely kill it uh it's still a tech that you basically are going to research every single time when you play the english um and the the increase of gold required and stone required i don't think is too bad um certainly a nerf but uh not crippling yeah i do want to point out too with this one uh that you have to research it from a keep uh, so I wonder if that makes the White Tower a little more enticing now, because that's I mean, you got to imagine you have to have 800 stone for the keep and then another 150 stone to research this. So I wonder if that'll sway people because overall, that's a cheaper stone cost to go with the White Tower than it would be going King's Palace, because even if you wanted to go two TCs, you have you be spending less stone to go for the White Tower now. So I don't know. I wonder how that'll affect people's play. I think White Tower is excellent now. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, I think that, I kind of think that they're, the network of Citadels, I kind of think they're kind of, they're trying to, I don't want to say they're nuking it, but like, it is a really strong technology and they already, they already kind of nerfed it. I feel like they don't need to do anything more to it. I don't know. I just, I'm not a big fan of nerfs, period. I kind of like everyone just gets stronger together. So like, but yeah, I kind of think, See me, I don't use the network of Citadels that much. So I don't play that much English. How, how like how much of an advantage it gives you in a it battle? Is, it is uh, a lot. It, yeah, it is it is, it is civilization defining. I think it, it's the tech that defines the English combat superiority. What yeah. is more important? Uh enclosures or network of Citadel? 
Uh, <laughs> network is ah, uh, that's, that's so tough. Because I thought English was network. I thought English was enclosures all the way. I mean, both of those are like auto pick. Yeah, both uh, of those are pretty auto pick. Um, I would say in English, English doesn't have, uh, and this is a thing that people said about English for a while is that their castle age sucks. Network of citadels is what makes castle age bearable for English. That's okay. the kind of the edge that it gives them that keeps them viable in the castle age. So to have that be nerfed to the ground when that's it feels rough. Yeah. It's, it's it's I don't know. Yeah. Do you think it's going to move English even a little bit lower down the tier list or you think English is still Here's the thing is everyone's yeah, been yeah. hating this season uh in particular. Everyone's been hating on English so hard because that's what you, people play against the most. So it makes sense that True. people dislike it and they have gotten a little bit stronger as of this season. This patch obviously kind of pulls them back a little bit. People just yeah. hate English so hard. Uh they're yeah, not that good a funny. sieve though. They're really not. I, yeah, I think this is a nerf uh, on the high level. I don't think this is going to impact, um, be much of a nerf to the lower level play on the ladder, just because a lot of lower level players uh, don't have, um, don't have everything down where they know that they need to research network of citadels, but also start their tower creep out um, to spread that buff to wherever a fight could possibly be. Um, so Can I, I think say, oh, I'm sorry, no, I need to cut you off. You know, keep talking. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think uh, where English really isn't that strong on the conqueror level right now, um, mm. but is kind of dominant uh, in the lower tiers. I feel like this won't make it that much weaker on the lower tiers, but certainly going to nerf it a little bit uh, in the highest level of play. Yeah, mm, I think it's sense. definitely and English hasn't been very high on the high tier of play for a while now. Um, and I feel like English really excels at kind of two things. They really excel at the late Imperial game. And that's where I think the higher level players play English a lot more in that Imperial age kind of game. Um, I do think English also excels at like a good Ram Rush feudal all in um, and maybe oh, holding yeah. off pushes. That can be really the two hallmarks of English. So I don't really feel like this this nerf affects the english ram rush at all uh it just kind of makes their yeah. castle age hurt a little more than it already did so okay that's why so that's why hre this. really kicks english's butt because when they go fast castle english just can't oh yeah up at all that makes sense you know something i'm noticing on like um looking at these patch notes something that no one knew which is crazy um the wingard footman up until this patch before the patch, they had no counter. Yeah, they were cracked. I didn't even realize oh, that they were cracked. Not, no one was using them. Like, there was not the crossbowman. No one, like, anything that had, like, because uh, I'm looking here, it's anything that took, like, that did bonus damage against heavy units. They're not, like, they finally now are doing damage. Before, like, you could have literally spawned them out and nothing would have done damage to them. Like, crossbowman would have got cooked. Everything would have got ran through. And that's crazy because I didn't even know. Like, I feel like if people really knew that, Wingard Footman would be a lot more popular. I kind of don't like that change to the Wingard Footman because I don't think they were used that much. Now, I, I guess I guess anything. I guess the thing is that English Imperial is already so strong. But oh, yeah. with the network of Citadel's change and with this, I feel like it just slows English down quite a bit. I don't know. English is going to yeah. be, I think, in a uh, English is still a viable civilization. Don't get me wrong. Oh, uh, yeah, it definitely, definitely feels like this is a reaction to. Kind of the hate. And, you know, I, I saw a lot of posts saying that this wasn't enough for English, that English needs to get nerfed even more. Uh, and I think people really don't like just don't like playing against them. But they're the basic starter sieve. Uh, they have to be at least viable. And I don't yeah. think it's a bad thing just because a, a sieve is easy to play. I don't think that makes it bad by design. Like English is easy, but it's not. I don't feel like it's broken easy. You know, I don't feel like a, a pro isn't getting a much more advantage by playing it versus roots or something, you know. Well, definitely. Like, I mean, like I said, with English, really, I mean, you kind of just got to know, like, you kind of just all, I guess with any civilization, you just got to counter what they're good at, you know? I mean, really, I, like, really side note, I played a game against English, I think it was an English mirror, and I went heavy economic, and he went more heavier uh, military-wise, and I was at a big disadvantage, but really how I ended up coming out, I shouldn't have won the game at all, but how I ended up coming out winning, I just attacked what English is really good at, and he had, he gave me a lot of map control, and I just raid his economy. And, like, you know, like, it's just, you know, you got to take what they're good at and uh, make them fold that way. Because English is the starter civilization. They're like the, they're the gateway sieve. 
but and they are very popular on the lower level, especially. But they're not unbeatable. I think I think English is I'm you do see them a lot on the ladder, I will admit. But I don't mind playing them. I, I don't mind. It's not that big of a deal to me. I was more annoyed when French in their prime than English. <laughs> yeah, that's how I feel still. I, I, I think having played English a lot, and English is one of my main sieves. I will clarify. Like I am an English guy. I also oh, really, nice. I also really do love HRE and I do like French. I haven't been touching French lately. I do want to talk about that in just a second. That French got a small uh, buff. Yeah, you're um, hit, man. French is back up, man. I'm sorry. Is it? Is it? Well, well, we'll get there in just one second. I, let me finish this thought. Uh, I do feel like English. I mean, I've played a lot of English. I never mind. I feel like when you play a sieve that often, and English is kind of, it's versatile, but it's not overtly too like wild and what they can do. I feel like most people should just know how to stop them by now. And like, there's a couple things they can do. I think it comes down to scouting. If you scout out what English does, you can find a way to counter them. And that's kind of true of most civs, I think. Uh, but mm. when you play against a basic civ like that, you, you just, it was like playing French. Everyone kind of figured out French and you just knew what to expect. You knew how to counter them and French were, have been in a tough spot until yeah. recently. I've seen a little uptick in French play. And I think part of that, the only only real change to French was the uh, villager production buff. Mm. So for those who aren't aware, uh, the French have a passive increase buff to their town centers uh, in their villager production speed. And that increases as they go throughout the ages. So, for instance, uh, it used to be I think this I think it reverted. I think this is a reversion back to what it was. Uh, but as of the beginning of this season, it was 10 percent rate increase in dark age 10 percent increase in feudal and then 15 percent increase uh in castle and then 20 in imperial now however uh they've reverted that back so when you reach the feudal age that goes up to 15 percent increase and then in castle it's 20 percent and then imperial 25 percent increase for town centers because french remember they had the two tc build and then the increase of uh, TCs happened uh, for the stone cost, which made that a lot more difficult. And they got the nerf to their uh, production speed uh, bonus. Mm -hmm. So now this production speed has been, I think, essentially reverted back to what it was originally. So how does that, I mean, have we, are we seeing a lot more French? Is that enough of a change? Uh, if you ask me, I like I've seen more French on ladder. Oh yeah, um, I don't know if that's me just like identifying French now and knowing that this uh that this patch hit man i gotta go and play french after this i gotta get back into that i was big oh, yeah, french in season two um i feel like i've seen more of them though i look if you ask me i like okay because like me like you know I'm, i've actually i watch a lot of pros play and uh this on the pro level it's becoming i don't know if pros are experimenting more they want to see if it's more viable but i'm seeing a lot more french play on the pro level a hundred percent. All the big names, you know, they're all just, you know, giving French. I'm, some people think that the changes really haven't made much of a difference. Other people disagree. A uh, very popular uh, play style with the French was a uh, two TC build. And, you know, with this uh, town center, you know, buff, it it may not sound like a lot. Because the thing about like, you know, when you talk about Age Empire, it seems like all these minor these might like, for example, like, you know, something go from like training time of 30 seconds to 26 seconds. It's like, OK, what is that four seconds going to do? But it adds up over time. And now the two TC build with the French is more viable. And one thing I will say about the French is that we I feel like we kind of never really talked about this with the French. They are also they they have been they are better now, but they have been really good in team games. They're yeah. not. They really like like solo. They have their problems, but team games. French have are still a very good option. Oh, absolutely! Like the the Royal Knights in feudal Insane. to have the mobility on bigger maps is key. Mm -hmm. And um, I think yeah, this is just a straight up buff to French and team games. Uh, Almost definitely. I, I think uh, they're just gonna stay um, as one of the the top picked civs mm -hmm. for teams. That's kind well, of like, a preview. That's kind of a preview too about the map. I, I've been thinking about that. Like mm -hmm. bigger maps and the way the the large four v four maps, especially, feel very very large in scale. And I've been thinking about that. Like that's that increase having the cavalry matters so much more on larger maps. And I think that's part of the reason why you guys mentioned French really does just dominate in team games. Like you should always have an aggressive civ like either French or another cavalry civ, maybe like Ottomans mm -hmm. or Sapahi or something that can travel fast. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, like, uh, and honestly, if you uh, like, I just feel that I, I might be kind of by I, I, French has been my favorite civilization from the start cool. of the game. You like the way they look, don't lie, Sir Neville. To, I'm not gonna lie, those French, <laughs> those, those royal knights are dope looking. I mean, listen, my name is literally Sir Neville because of a French knight, like, but with that being said, like, uh, I just feel like. You know, I feel like it was a. I feel like French. This is a start. I think French next patch there will be another buff because like a lot of like French kind of like they didn't get nuked, but you know, saying the crease of the town center, the you know making from three hundred stone to three fifty stone that hit the French. They made chivalry cost more. That hit the French, and you know then they lowered the amount of like you know the economic boost that French got with their TCs, and I think the biggest weakness. If the French's economy isn't on point, then that's where the French gets weaker because mm. the French really needs food and they, they're expensive civilization. So with them having that little economic boost, it makes them more economic, economically viable. I think they become that that's a tick up rather than a tick down. And I, I think French, I think, you know, because you can't deny it. Uh, a French knight is an S tier unit. It's just it's excellent. Like, you know, it doesn't scale. You know, after a while, you make a bunch of experiment. Don't really scale the best. But it's one of the strongest. It's one of the most effective units in the game, especially, especially in that having feudal a feudal age. Yeah. yeah, I think French is still the best feudal age. I, I don't wouldn't, dis- I wouldn't disagree. I won't disagree with that. I definitely think that feudal age push can be dangerous. I think you, I think you nailed it on the head, though, Sir Neville. I never really thought about this, but French is a very expensive sieve, and they're trying to be aggressive. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned it; their eco just. I mean, they they have the slightly they had the slightly faster. Uh, builder production but that's not a huge buff next to like the 2tc song and they also have uh i mean yeah they have cheaper resource drop off buildings but that's like saving you maybe Mm -hmm. maybe 300 wood a game and i don't know that that's enough of a swing to make a huge difference yeah i I think i think the devs are ticking up i think they're gonna probably maybe add a little bit more on as uh you know the game i could see that um looking at some other things uh there's there's this is I've heard somewhat people describe this as a slim patch, but there's a lot of changes, little changes that I think will make big differences. A lot of little balance tweaks. Uh, Mongols, for instance, the Kurlatai landmark damage has been reduced from 25% to 20. Uh, Ottomans took a pretty hefty nerf, I think, in a couple areas. Uh, needed, I think it was a needed nerf. Uh, for instance, the blacksmith and university production influence bonus. Uh, now, it was 25 in feudal, 33 in castle, and 40 in imperial. Now it's 20, 30, and then still 40. So a slight nerf in those first two ages and then back to 40 in the final age. But the real kicker, I think, is the Seagate Castle landmark. Uh, the trader move speed has been reduced from 40% to 30%. And I just want to say, thank goodness. I <laughs> your, your spirits like, can't even touch them when they're there. Like nothing. I, I, I saw this. I've only saw this uh, landmark in play a couple times. It's, I don't usually go late game with Ottomans. So I don't usually just didn't get to see it too often, but I saw that I, I played one game a couple weeks ago and I like I was like, holy cow, like they just like just gone. It was like insane how fast those traders go from that influence. Uh, so, I didn't realize that. Oh, it was like nuts. I mean, imagine a 40 percent speed increase to a trade. Yeah, it, yeah it's so oh, slow. I, love it. I can't believe <laughs> oh, this guy. Believe you got an Ottoman yeah. main in here. He's in like any of this. Yeah. <laughs> so that's no, now 30%. Uh, I yeah. mean, it's fair. Uh, I don't know. Ottomans I, they're still in such a great position. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because you don't, you don't even have to go like Seagate Castle. That's not like an auto pick um, Imperial landmark, especially with like the just generic trade nerf this season. Uh huh. Um, there also was a, I think it was 10% trade nerf across the board. Just that's a big one too. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, but uh, the university itself is still um, a really decent landmark. It's you, you age up into age four, have the university available, and then its uh, production influence is much larger than a regular university or a blacksmith. Mm. So if you're going to go into just like continuing to build production, um, continuing to like make your military giant in the imperial age, um, if you're not trading or anything, still a decent pick. Uh, but it is a shame for me personally. <laughs> <that> <laughs> I mean, it's still thirty percent. Yeah. 
30% is still going to look like they're just burring and just running around. But man, 40% was absolutely, hey. I don't think I've ever seen Spaceballs, uh, the Star Wars spoof, <laughs> but like, like ludicrous <laughs> speed, sir, we've never gone ludicrous speed before. <laughs> like it literally was just insane how bad like i swear there was like more i couldn't even see like the details of these things they were just so motion blurred by just going so fast oh man it was i i just i i lost that game by the way if you guys can't tell there was no way i was <laughs> there's just nothing i could do to stop those things i tried it was it was a well, heroic effort i mean there's the vizier point that gives you additional uh gold per trade as well yeah uh, with that 10% increase or decrease in trade too, uh, is that enough? I mean, trade has been talked about by a lot in the last season and a half or so. Uh, where's trade at with that 10% reduction nerf? I don't know if it's enough to stop it. What do we think? I mean, you don't want to stop it entirely. I'm kind of on a wait and see thing with this. Uh, mm-hmm. 10% is a good start. Um, let's see this play out for a season. Uh, it, I think trade is going to be a little less oppressive than it was at the start of the season. Um, but we'll give it time. Um, maybe we'll get one more patch before the end of the season. If trade is still just completely out of control. Hmm. I, don't, yeah, I, I, want read, I want to read, sorry, I'll let you go in just a second. There's another, I, want uh, go, I want to read the developers note on this. Uh, they say that the, the, this balance change is a stepping stone on our way to a bigger change, uh, way to bigger changes to the trade system. Thank you for everyone for all the feedback and discussions. We are listening and have future plans for additional improvements. So they are definitely planning on, I think they're kind of what you mentioned, Bill, kind of the wait and see, 10% just yep. to see, and they don't want to do anything drastic, which I, I don't disagree with. I think it's the right thing to do. Anyways, what were you going to say, Anderson Nevels? Uh, actually, a hot take. I seen a player, he, uh, I, I can't even remember his name, but I was watching him uh, just kind of passively. And he was saying, uh, he's like a big StarCraft II player. And he was saying that he wished that trade neutral trade posts were out of the game completely. He mm. said that he wished that you can only make trade for team games. He thinks that uh, Age of Empires 4 is a map control centric game. And that once you make trade a thing, it completely defeats the purpose of getting map control. So obviously I don't really necessarily agree with him. I you know me. I, I'm. I guess I'm kind of weird. Like yes, yeah, said. Like I. You know I never really saw trade as a huge issue. It it kind of like because it wasn't really that big before, especially in one v ones. It wasn't a huge option, but now it is starting to become a little bit more. You're starting to see a lot more. And I disagree with that player on getting rid of them because there's so many trade landmarks in the game. They were like a lot of landmarks become obsolete. And uh, but 10 percent, like Bill said, 10 percent is a good starting point and just see where it takes off from there. You know, and I don't think it should be if they do increase it more, you know, 15 max. Like, I don't see them like because you go over 15, 20, 25 percent. You're basically you're calling like nuking trade. And that is decreases a strategy in the game. Like, like you just completely get rid of trade then you're going to play someone and know, okay, they're not going to trade. Like, you don't got to even scout for it because you know it's pretty much busted. It's done. So that, 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 just, that just eliminates an aspect of the game because trade is also a strategy, and trade can be countered. You know, like, I do think I like how the, the CJ Castle it makes traders not as fast anymore. So you can, like you said, you said that, that, that trader was outrunning your spearmen, so, like, nothing, you couldn't really get rid of it because it was the trade mm-hmm. was so fast. Kind of but, on this, you know, if I can interrupt you, Sir Neville's. Yes, I'm sir. No, you're thinking, good. You're good. Thinking about this, you bring up some good points. And I think kind of what we're dancing around is what is the uh, place of trade in this game? Like, what role is it trying to mm-hmm. fill? What is its purpose? And you kind of mentioned, like, you're that player you mentioned disliked it because there's a lack of map control. To me, that says that the maps need to be reworked a little bit. And we'll be talking about this a lot mm-hmm. more in a second. Because when I, I've noticed uh, one of the best ways I've been beating Mollians a lot this season, uh, Mollians were my bane of last season when they came out. Now I have been, I found I had a, every time they try to go trade, uh, walling off trade, like physically walling off the oh, trade yeah. market oh, yeah. is a huge way to deny that. You can actually deny that oh, and make yeah. it so difficult. And that's what everyone does. If you, if you have a, you're contesting that market spot and you can claim it or not claim it just as like a sacred site, essentially, uh, where you can like wall it off and make it yours or put a keeper tower it up. And I've seen that that's more effective to me than trying to kill the traders to just get a passive defense that blocks them or kills them on their own. 
So Most I think good. maybe that uh, maybe I, I think the worst parts is like all tie is one of the worst uh, offenses. Of this, it's the worst map in the game. It's uh, the worst map in the game. Because that you have like a guaranteed easy to, to wall off trade where you can have your trade. It's in the back mm-hmm. corner. It's too easy to defend. I think that's why civilizations like China or other maybe trade civs like Malians do way too well on that map because mm-hmm. it, the map is not designed well. If those trade posts were like moved somewhere, I don't know where you, I, the map needs a bit of a rework, but we'll we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. But I think the trade sure. breaks that map. And I think I think trades in an OK spot. I don't think. I think yeah. there are, it just needs, I think it needs to be thought of. It needs to be caught more instead of just put the markets in the corner. I think you have to think about what's, what's, how's that going to affect the gameplay and what is the purpose of trade? Because trade should be a risk that you can go for, but it should also have be able to be stopped as well. I think finding that balance yeah. is kind of the struggle. It's yeah. a little more punishable. I mean, I feel like trade should reward the fact that you do have map control. Uh, uh-huh. I mean, mm-hmm. on certain maps like Altai, you don't need map control to to run the trade, <laughs> but it should be a reward for having map control. And I mean, if this if this StarCraft Two Pro wants to play Age of Empires Four without trade, you can play play Age of Empires <laughs> Two. It doesn't have neutral trade. <laughs> oh, no, really? It's trading in one v one. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Beal, I like what you mentioned about like how trade should be map controlled. Do you remember that game we casted yesterday on Baltic? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He didn't go uh, for it, but we were mentioning it. I think it there. Do you want? Do you want to go ahead and dive into that for just a second? Where it, it was so close, um, it didn't completely turn around. But uh, the fact that uh, one of the Abbasid players was forced off of water in about mid to late feudal. Um, hmm. And immediately, immediately switched, um, went up to Castle, I believe, with the, the trade wing from the House of Wisdom and established insane trade in his backfield. And the other player never sent any horsemen, never scouted it out, tried to disrupt it. And if that Abbasid player took like a better fight it was just a bad micro he just fight to age up he had the gold he just didn't actually balance his yeah. decoded age up yeah he could have gone up to imp he could have taken some micro fights better but the fact that losing water in baltic but establishing uncontested trade mm-hmm. uh, almost got him right back into the game well and water trade is the best in the game and the other player took over the ocean and could have so we, we had mentioned this. Now we were kind of wondering like is he going to go for trade yeah. like he took over map control his reward was you get all the free fishing but then you also could have started maritime trade and he didn't and we were kind of lamenting that he didn't go for it because the way his he had one that was close to him but the market on the other side was kind of close to his opponent's base but it was easily his like he had the map the water control he could have done maritime trade and didn't and so uh yeah, that was an interesting game where trade had an interesting place, and I think a good place in that game. Yeah, uh, interesting made the game a lot more interesting. Uh, and I mean, of course, it's Baltic. So if the player on water had established yeah, water he, trade, he would have won. Yeah, yeah. Over, we'll yeah. be talking about the, the merits stable. of water in general here in a second. There's one last uh, thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep us rolling along here. One last balance change I think we do need to talk about. Uh, there were a couple other things to preserve uh, specific sieves. I highly recommend everyone who is listening to this podcast go through and just actually read the patch notes. There's a lot in there, surprisingly large number of things in there. Uh, I do want to talk about the trebuchet change. Um, trebuchets have been nerfed, essentially. Well, I won't say nerfed. They've been reworked. Um, so they are weaker. So they have been nerfed as far as their health. Uh, counterweight trebuchets went from 210 to 170. Regular, uh, what is that? Uh, or no, that's just a counterweight trap. Yeah. yeah, the traction trap for traction Mongols trap, also yeah. Or to nerf. Yep, they both went, they both got nerfed. So counterweight trap just the counterweight went from 210 to 170. The traction trap for the Mongols went from 190 to 150. Uh this the cost also decreased, however, uh from five for a counterweight trap. I'll, I'll just go from counterweight traps. Mongols also had a comparable nerf. But for the normal trap, most of us use 500 wood and 250 gold down to 400 wood, 150 gold. So that's substantially cheaper. Uh, and then it also uh, got quite a bit less damage. So 50 damage to 40 and then bonus damage against buildings from 450 to 375. And the building time has been reduced from 35 seconds to 30 seconds. So what this essentially is doing, looking at kind of how it works, trebs are now cheaper and weaker. 
so you can produce and produce faster. So you can get it, you can feel the treb a lot quicker, but its value and the value of a trebuchet is less. So. Mm. Yeah, I like it. I do too. Um, I think it, at first I was kind of iffy against it because I do like trebs. I don't like defensive sieves. Um, anything that can reward trebuchets and like taking down defenses is good in my book. Um, so I was like, oh, you're making the damage weaker. You're making the trebs like actually weaker to kill. I didn't like that, but the cost reduction, I think, just outweighs all of that. Um, mm. It's playing, playing earlier and the fact that it's only 400 wood to get a treb out. Yeah. You're not so like, you're, you're not floating that wood for as long uh, before you spend it on something. And I think you're able to get more trebs out on the fields easier um, because you're not running into the situation where, Oh, I already spent my wood on units or other production buildings. Couldn't let it mass up to 500. I think 400 is a much easier target uh, to achieve to get a treb. Um, and I think, yeah, making them a little bit more of a glass cannon. Uh, they don't do as much damage, but and they, they'll take more if you can get units on top of the treb, uh, mm -hmm. but they still take the three shots from a sprinkled. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. like the long distance uh, counterplay hasn't really changed, um, but it does reward players who can get to get to undefended trebs and take them down. So yeah. I am I'm a fan in general of mm -hmm. this change. Here's the developer's note on this. Uh, they say, our goal with the trebuchet changes are to allow players to react more easily and quickly to enemy structures by reducing the initial investment cost. It does make trebuchets less population efficient in the late game. However, with the recent update, we buffed rams and bombards in the late game to mm -hmm. provide different options. And I think that's actually a really key point is that the trebs are no longer, trebs used to be the go-to uh, late game still. I mean, like, why would you ever pick a bombard when trebs have more range and you get five of them and they can just melt anything? I think this yeah. definitely changes that and makes you go, ooh, rams and bombards become mm -hmm. uh, the better options potentially. Again, they're like, trebs are less efficient. So I kind of like how they've changed rams as well uh, with the season. I'm just kind of looking at a siege in general because rams are really good uh, in feudal and they're really good in imperial when you have a lot of them. The trebs mm -hmm. own castle age, I think. And then, mm. you know, in Imperial, the bombards become reasonable again with the because those are more uh, cost efficient, I think, at that point, more uh, population efficient, I should say. Yeah, I love it, man. Hey, like like the developer said, make bombards great again. Make bombards great the, again. I, <laughs> I remember the I remember I'll the just, golden age of bombard. Man. Shout now, play uh, play Ottomans if you like bombards. Great oh, bombards. Yeah, great yeah, bombard. oh, oh yeah, get that units. big bombard out there. Oh yeah. You want a like Magnell? You want a Bombard? Why don't you just have both? <laughs> You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That, that, I, that's crazy. I forget about the Ottoman and their uh, their great Bombards, man. I thought I don't seem as much as I should, but they are on. They're insane. But yeah, like I, I, I like you know, just my quick little take on. It. I don't got very much to say. You know, Bill pretty much hit on the head. Yeah, I like how me. I just like making everything viable. You mm -hmm. know, and I'm I, I'm gonna say something, and it's like. Uh, it's still a topic with Siege, but something that I think they're not getting, no, that's not getting any love in this game. And that is why are they not giving any love to these Rebaldequins? I say Rebaldequin <laughs> buff when. That's, dude, I was just thinking that. Go. Like, what is up with these Rebaldequins? Like, all these men in arms, like, let's get these Rebaldequins, make them cheaper, put them in, I know, I don't know. If it's I think the accurate. problem is, like, why go for a Rebaldequin when you can just go for crossbows? Yeah, but we're bald when you mash those up. It's like it's literally a men in arms mangonel. Like yeah. they will lay down some men in arms. Like, like, okay, like, and this is where I'm probably in the minority because I want Rebaldequins in Castle Age. And I know it's not really historically accurate, but I'm just like, dude, like these men in arm rushes, like, cause you're such but I don't know. Cause I'm kind of iffy too, because then it really like the men in arms rush becomes way less viable, like viable. Cause but like I just think that a lot of like if you get to castle before your enemy, you can just rush men in arms. They really do not have a, a, a counter. The Abbasid, maybe with their camel archers, they do some damage to men in arms. But really, like there's so many games that like I've just not even I turn my brain off. I get to castle and the enemy's way behind. I just rush them men in arms. 
and get to get their little, you know, get their upgrades and uh, and boom, like there's really nothing enemy can do. But no, if there's the only enemy... one other C. I was sorry, I have to interrupt you again. Oh, no. The yeah, one other siege. I was just thinking about these Revaldequins. The only other siege unit I think that gets less love than Revaldequin, siege towers. Oh yeah, listen, I have I have a I have a hot take on that too. <laughs> Someone I, I mentioned that and I said make siege towers great. I said make them to where if you garrison up, they can fire arrows. And people were like, no, that's broken. That's so correct. Uh, like, make it a, make, make it no, a tower on no, wheels. No, <laughs> no, no. You don't see that. Don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. I want to see all the cheese. I want to see all the cheese. I want to see everyone. I want to see monitors, out of windows. I want to see everything going crazy. Does this, this is maybe, a, a, I mean, we're still kind of talking about the patch update, uh, but before we get into our game, maybe, uh, what do what I mean? We're kind of talking about like what what is the place of trade in this game? What is the place of siege towers in this game? Do you think the developers kind of just expected stone walls to be more pivotal to this game with like stone wall fighting? I, I remember when I when I was looking at this game. I remember when I was looking at it in this game, uh, learning that you can put units on top of stone walls was like, oh, that's so cool! I want this game. That was like one of the things that made me so hyped about this game because I remember playing Age Empires three, Age Empires two. And I thought having units on stone walls was so and I didn't play competitively then back then. I just played as like a kid. But I thought that was so cool. That's what I maybe want to play the game. And it's not used at all in this game. Yeah. Last time you put an archer on a stone wall for a purpose. Yeah. Like, like never. <laughs> well, it's so hard to micro. It's so hard to get them to get on there and to stay on there and to actually shoot the targets you want without walking off the wall and chasing after the targets. It needs kind of a rework, I think, to be viable and be worth it. I agree. I feel like stone walls, man, are like very just like to like, you know, as a community, people just hate stone walls. Like stone yep. wall towers are literally like even out of tournaments are like no one makes those. Like well, they're banned them, half the time, yeah. They're they're messaging you. You make them even like if you like, you know, making a ladder game, they'll message you and be like, Wow, bro, stone tower walls, that was that what we're doing here. Is that what we're doing? Like, wow, like you look yourself in the mirror and still do this. Like, like you're like a horrible person. <laughs> like like people do not like you if you make stone wall towers and stone walls in general. I think they, I think maybe siege towers be more viable like earlier in the games, your know, life cycle because people used to make stone walls a lot in feudal. Uh huh. But now, like that is like not like. Well, that's like playing. tab walk. Uh, sorry, that's, that's I just use the kid's word for it. That's like super <laughs> taboo too. Like going stone walls and oh, feudal. Yes, I mean, that's definitely. a big no no. Oh yeah, people will like literally like like they will they will be fly, they will be t- keyboard on fire to be typing you like really dude what are you doing like like my like i played my brother just yesterday and he made stone walls and feudal and i, I was like we we're in discord chat and i was like you call yourself who are you i don't know you I'm like, what are you doing i was like i had to go to this house and have a discussion with him we had an intervention so what's going on with you man is everything all right but yeah it's just not a thing anymore but i know to me siege towers they need something to be reworked with that and rebuild so, so i gotta do siege towers can you like boost units over a palisade wall those can you no, get on you the can't. other side it's of the only wall? only stone walls uh, see i mean there's a there's an easy fix yeah i guess that well, could the work is like towers the way to like get over palisades mm. and then like maybe you do a stealthier for like a stealthier rate like a stealth rate. Yeah. I, that's what I've, I've been thinking or about like maybe i should experiment French. with these get some knights behind like, well you can't use palisades. knights in a yeah, I can't use can't use cavalry. No, you can't. And that, that's that's why I think it's not used. Is because late game when you're trying to get a raid in and trying to be send just a group in, you're not going to use men at arms. You're going to go right. for knights, but you can't yeah. put knights in the uh, the siege tower. You can only put men at arms, spears, crossbows. You can't do cavalry or siege. So that's but I think that's think why it's not it, used. That would be that would be a good raid. Like I mean, even men at arms aren't as fast. But if you want to, like, like, you know, get a good distraction, your enemy, you know, have some men at arms to set outside a stone wall and build a, st- a siege tower. And honestly, that would throw an enemy off. They'd be like, whoa, how did men at arms get in here? And I, I think if people actually utilize them, because I've seen people in the Discord actually utilize it and win with them. I just feel like if somebody found a viable strategy with them, st- siege towers could be somewhat viable. I've been thinking about that, yeah. I, I, it's a thought I've been thinking about a lot. Like, could they be viable? Like, in a team game... When you gotta get away, they're completely stonewalled off, and obviously most people just try and ram up and just break the wall. But what if you want to be sneaky? Mm-hmm. Like, is is it viable? Is it worth the investment? Uh, right now, mm-hmm. that I feel like it's either it isn't or we just don't know, and no one's 
bothered to try and find out because the other methods seem to work too. So maybe maybe that'll be my homework this week is I'll try and maybe I'll try and see if we can do something with it. I have one last take. I'm gonna say one thing. Okay, I'll make it quick. What if siege towers monks could garrison them with relics? And I say protect your monk. What if that became a thing? Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, because it, it it would delay, like, because um, you wouldn't be able to easily capture. Uh, yeah. Right. Like, lastly, you'd have to wait until you could get the siege yeah. tower out if you wanted to go for the more dangerous yeah. ones. Yeah, maybe keep, keep your monk safe. I don't know. I'm just thinking. I'm just trying I mean, to be fine. The speed of a siege fine, tower, especially for those far mobile. ones, why not just build a tower next to it, anyways? Possibly, yeah. I'm I don't just, know. I'm just spitballing. I like. I like. I, I definitely think we need to have a better, more in-depth conversation of yeah, what needs definitely. to be done about this. Um, are you guys definitely. ready for our game today? No. Yeah. No. Let's get I've got. I've got. It's, it's, <laughs> no worries. It, it, this is not a competitive game. This is more of a. Uh, we're all just kind of hanging out and playing. Let me share my screen. Oh, I like it. I like uh, it. Everyone at home is not going to be. Able, I'll, I'll post this uh, image of this. Uh, a link to this probably with the uh, the episode for everyone who wants to see our ranking. We're making a tier list today. Someone uh, in our Discord for this episode for the show mentioned you guys should do a tier link a tier list of some sort and i was like yeah that's a cool idea and then our topic today being maps i have pulled up uh the current map pool let me share my screen so you guys can see here do 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 let's see there we go okay you guys should be able to see now in discord my my tier list i've got here so i've got uh the ranked pool for 1v1s the maps and i've got our tier list starting from s a b c and d s being the s tier perfectly balanced as everything should be uh, a being decent, usually a good ride. B is going to be meh. It can maybe depend on the seed. C, not great. And then D, why is this in the game? So <clears throat> the map pool currently, I've got uh, Hideout. We've got Prairie, Baltic, Dry Arabia, French Pass. I, I'm going to call it, say Four Corners. Is that right? Four Lakes. Four, four, lakes, four lakes. Four Lakes. And we have High View, uh, Lipany, and Mountain Clearing. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. We can start with any map you guys want. I don't know. Maybe we start with let's start let's with Dry Arabia. Let's just start with Dry oh, Arabia okay. here. Ah, oh, Dry Arabia. Dry Arabia. Um, I think this goes without question. People think this is S tier, right? Are we are we all in agreement just off the bat? I have no argument against that. I agree. It, now I will say I disagree with the naming. I mentioned this to to Beal yesterday. I think it's ill named. I think it should be uh, okay. Meadow. It should be just called Meadows because there's trees. It's not really a dry Arabia. A dry Arabia to me would be mm-hmm. zero trees, more like prairie. Uh, That's smart. I will I, I say, don't know why they're calling it dry Arabia versus regular Arabia. Arabia used to be the name of the map, uh, like in earlier entries in this in the series. Yeah, I don't know why they I, added dry. It's um, not dry. It makes no sense. Usually when I play it, it's like that Mediterranean temperate or like it's, it never even looks like a desert. It, it always looks lush. It should be just called meadow. That's my only beef with the map. Besides that, it's it's perfectly balanced. <laughs> if, meadow if not actually a little sounds better. I like meadow better. It sounds like more like, I don't know, meta. Like, oh, meadow. Let's play meadow. Okay, like, I feel like it matches what you see more often, right? You see some patches of trees. Yeah. There's lots of open grass. Yeah, to me, that final destination. Final, de- yeah, <laughs> final destination for a of the empires. It's, I do I like think it. it's a boring. It's a boring map in that it's basic. There's no really interesting features, but it's balanced. It plays well more normally. There's enough wood to last. It's a good map. Everyone loves it. That, that's why I, the name turns me off from it, though. I will say that. Uh, okay, <laughs> hideout. Let's talk about hideout, guys. Mm, and this is for one. This is now, now, keep in mind. This is a one v one ranked pool map. Uh, I think in team games, maybe more viable. In a one v one, what do we think about hideout? Mm, this is this is a good one. I don't know how I, I feel about it, hideout. It's weird. I want to put it in a B because I I don't hate it. Um, I kind of like the custom map wood wall that's based on this a little better. I agree. Um, it's just because it's easier in wood wall to actually chop through to your opponent than it is in hideout. Um. I think uh, I, I, I lean towards C, actually, I think on this one. I lean towards C, too. I think I lean towards C. I, I think B, I, B, I think uh, Woodwall would be a B or an A for me. I think that fits more what they wanted out of this map. <laughs> Hideout just feels, uh, I don't know. It just, I feel like I don't like contesting the sides like it is. All the golds outside. Yeah. It's a weird map. I think it's really, really good for Roos. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't tend to like maps where you have to go very, very far and out of the way. And you're playing on the yeah. outsides. I like maps where it's an option, but 
where all the battling's on the edges, it just feels kind of bad. And plus, with the trade markets kind of in the back corner, it not my favorite. Oh, I hear you. It's one of those maps. I dislike maps where there are multiple um, like lanes to send an army and. <laughs> Yeah, like hideout is one of those where it's like, whoops, my army went down the wrong side of the map. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Now it's on the left side. And I'm being attacked on the right. And mm. uh, they're they're way over way out of position just because I 50 50 and chose to send them <laughs> down the left side <laughs> instead of the right. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's like a skill issue, scouting issue for me. But yeah, I, I don't think I like hideout. That's wrong. For, just because it's like very civilization specific like it's not like like you can't really play any civ like me for example i love a bassett and like uh it's just not as much it's not that many um like proxy food like i mean berries are cool but like you i don't know i'm not the biggest fan of idol it's not a bad map but like i feel like roos even still with the kremlin and like the extra wood gathering like i feel like roos is just such a dominant still dominant on this map that like it's very, like, I think Roost back when they were like a, a very low tier Civ, they like had all their wins on hideout. Yeah. Like, that's for like, they like had the highest win rate and it was only for hideout. It just, I just don't, I, I don't think, I, I don't think it helps that I don't really play well on this map either, that my opinion of it is so low. Yeah. I don't think I've won a game on hideout in a 1v1. <laughs> I, I, I just don't know that I've actually really had a good <laughs> win on hideout. Uh, and I don't, I don't like how it scales up in multiplayer either. Oh, um, really? Because I was going to say, I do actually enjoy Hideout as a multiplayer map. Yeah, and I sure. have, I, I personally, I don't, but I do know that if it was on a multiplayer map, it might be end up in the, the B category, like kind of meh, depends on the, depends on kind of the civs involved and stuff. Um, and in 1v1, I don't know why, I don't know, like, I know it was a popular map back in Age of Empires 2. It's a really popular it was map there. It, it was, was different. different. It was one of my favorite maps in AOE 2 uh, because it started you with full palisade wall around your base. Mm -hmm. uh, was, that, was that arena? Was that how I was like? Was no, it? no, no. It was like hideout, but imagine arena you have palisade walls wall. around you. Um, oh, okay, okay. Hideout is yeah. Instead of the uh, the wood lines coming up and it being like a like semicircle that you're in, it was more of a flat wood line and then. You were in a square of pre-built palisade walls. I and like I I really like that. You know, um, I don't they so, don't do anything like that for HM4. I don't think there's any maps no, that I could think right of that have had any kind of pre-made walls or pre-made any kind of thing and nothing like that of the sort. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I don't I got mixed opinions on whether it'd be good. I don't know that it'd be good. I don't like arena. Yeah, I don't like arena. <laughs> play arena, please. Um, <laughs> but I would I would like to play like a real version of like an AOE two version of hideout in AOE four. Um, I think, yeah, the starting, starting with Palisade walls, a map like that could be really, really interesting. Yeah. It's a boom fest map for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think in one V ones, we've decided it is uh, in C not great. So, uh, okay. What about Prairie? This is, I think a very, mm -hmm. I don't want to say controversial, but I feel like it's either you love it or you hate it. And sometimes you love to hate it and hate to love it. Where do we feel like <laughs> I mean, Prairie is at? If B is defined as depends on the seed, then I guess we yeah. put it B because there are so many glitched seeds where you just don't even spawn with resources. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Prairie is very meh to me. I think Prairie, like, it's not bad, but I don't I, like. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I just like because, like, you know, uh, once again, I just hate like it's not very good for me for like a very trash unit centric civ. Like it's just no wood. And like after a while, like dude, once you have like, your 10 minutes, 15 minutes of the game, you're like already desperate for wood. You're like, I don't know where to like you're like you're like right outside the enemy's base trying to collect wood because you are exhausted all yours. It's just it's I don't know. I don't like I've like I, it's very good for French. I kind it's of wish it had like French. a court uh, corner. It's good for MHRE yeah. too. I wish I had like just a corner, oh, yeah, like two corners yeah. of wood. Like one corner's got like yeah. a decent wood patch, and then another corner's got decent wood. So you have to kind of leave your base, but it's there is some reliable wood. Yeah, maybe just but a little that'd better. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Like I really like the idea of Prairie. Uh -huh. Um, and mm -hmm. for a while, like I was psyched to play it on rank ladder, and then I went to AOE four world, and I found out that I have like a fifteen percent <laughs> win rate. Yeah, Ottomans, Ottomans play kind of funny on that map. 
I had a really good yeah. French Ottomans fight where I was playing as French and I, I poor guy had like zero civs. He was only alive because of his military schools for the longest time. Are you, are you talking about that game? Yeah. yeah I mean, you mentioned that game. Right? Not, I think last, yeah. last time. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. I, I like the extra sheep. I really, I will say my, the little oh, dopamine yeah. rush I get when I hear the little bell every single time. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. The bell that we use for this show, even like that, that I love that. <laughs> I, mean, I love hearing all the sheep get gathered uh, and having going. It's the only map I go to scouts on still. Oh yeah, most definitely. Yeah, it's necessary with all the sheep on the map there. That's yeah. why French is so good, and I believe because you get all those sheep in your TC. If you can keep your food viable with the French, you can just flood out those knights, put more on gold, and like, man, I think French is very good on prairie. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I might even it. put this into C. I I don't know. I feel like <laughs> I was going on. I just said B just because there's glitch spawns still. Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave it in B. I'll leave. I'll leave it in B. I think it definitely could be better. I definitely think we don't love this map. Uh, I do think sometimes that gold, that larger gold vein, spawns so a little far, and it kind of is wonky. Uh, but I do mm. like the idea behind this map a lot. I will say, I do wish it was just maybe yeah. just a touch more wood, maybe in like a corner that's far away. Uh, but it's. I, I sometimes I love this map. Sometimes I hate it, and it really depends on how I how many sheep I gather and how easy my game ends up being. Yeah, uh, but you can get there's gonna be some strange strats on that map. Makes it makes oh, you yeah. play a little off meta, and I like that. Trade is also really good too. Like the Mongols are really good on Prairie, mm. which kind of breaks my heart. Like they're they're really good. I've been destroyed by Mongols on Prairie. All right, moving on to Baltic now. For S baby, S, S baby, S really? <laughs> no, nah, maybe okay. maybe A, maybe A. Really? I love Baltic. You like Baltic? I love Baltic. I listen. I'm telling you right now, boys. I'm telling you something right now. Yeah, water is beautiful. Don't hate on water. Uh, water map. I love Baltic. When it's Mediterranean, I give, I'll go back to its root name, Mediterranean. You know, what I'm saying that map. Listen, I'm telling you right now. And actually, I learned something. It's I'm making my extra sheep. I learned some a good civilization on it. But I, me, for example, the water we work in this uh, water is very. It's not play with anyone. They're like, yo, make sure there's no water maps, no water maps. But I think water in this game is great and compared to how it was in the game first launched. I when mean, the game well, first like, launched, yes. <laughs> listen, I'll be, I'll be the guy against the wall. I'll be the guy. Yeah. That's <laughs> I'll, I'll like be that, that meme, like that meme from Tangled where like <laughs> Flynn's got all the swords pointing to him. Exactly. Like, what's your opinion that gets everyone the blades yeah. pointing to you? <laughs> you ask me, listen, I, cause believe it or not, like, you know, I play in a variety of accounts, but, for some reason, I have a very like my one of my most positive win rates is from Baltic. Like, because I feel open the game right now, 1v1 me. We'll play Baltic. <laughs> Don't expose me right now. Don't expose me. I get cooked on it. I mean, but anyway, like I'm telling you right now, like, okay, this is why I think of it right here. Is that okay, you mentioned it earlier that if you lose water, I feel you still can have a chance in the game. And now we're going away. Now we're going in a full circle here because the trade is also viable on this on this map. For example, like I think the water we work with the rock paper scissors, you know, method of it, I believe works great. You know, a lot of people don't really like you know how you have to pretty much change your entire build order strat with going on water. But in my opinion, like it just I don't know why like. It really does. You really do. Like, it's a water map. Like, there's not many water maps in AOE anymore. It's actually the only map in the map pool that actually has that has water fights, you know? And I believe, like, it is very civilization dependent. Like, HRE, English, you know, Rus, like, they obviously, you know, they dominate on this map, China. But the thing about it is that, yes, if you kind of lose water, you do kind of lose the game. But there is a way to make a comeback, and the water fights in the, in the game, I, I love it. I personally love it. Wall up the sides, you can't get raid on land, and let's see who can win this water and I, get the fish and get the. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I will say. I will <laughs> say. Uh, I the thing with the trade, like that trade is kind of that you're you're right to an extent on that. I think that if you lose <clears> water, you can go trade. The problem is your opponent can also do that, and with Baltic, they acquire water trade access to that. So. I just it, water it, trade I, is not that good on Baltic, if you ask me, because the, the the route isn't that long. But it, so it, like it's better went, returns though, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it it does. But like you could like I mean I don't know I haven't like you know done the math. Yeah, but then you turn those docks into like free markets that you can just pump out. Uh, true, 
Well, and your opponent can't stop it because you already own water, so they yeah. literally cannot stop but like, it whatsoever. After a while, you know, the game only has 200 population, so after a while, you have to, like, you have to figure out, you know, how you're going to end the game. And I feel like, you know, if you start doing water trade, plus your fishing ships, plus your military ships, if you, I guess if you win water, that's when you start going trade. But I feel like, I don't know, I'm, I'm in a minority, obviously. Like, I feel that... Winning water, it 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 is a different aspect of the game. It's a different. You gotta you have to change up your whole gameplay on get maps like this. Like any build order you had memorized, you got written down, pretty much crumble it up because it's not gonna be the same. And I don't know. I just like the aspect. I I love the water remake because when the game first launched, the water was so. I was the person that thought water. I mean, I think everybody thought water was horrible. It was very unbalanced. But now. It's more balanced. I mean, you still got your better civilizations, but I feel that, and I, and I love the way the ships look in the game too. I'm very, you know, aesthetically pleased by the way the game looks. So the way the ships look, you know, archer ships, the way they all counter each other. Me, I'm a fan. You know, maybe not S tier, but I flip A. All right, all right. I'm jumping in here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a stop to this. <laughs> They're already talking about it. It's Go one get of those them, maps. Bill. Go get them. <laughs> uh, even if even if you take out water, like I was talking about with hideout, is you got two lanes to send army down. It's one of those maps where it's like, oops, army's on the <laughs> yeah, wrong true, side true, of this. True. Uh, that's an issue. Um, I think the biggest problem with Baltic is it's actually a race to see who can get the feudal navy the fastest, just yeah. because with how how small that pond is relative, like how uh, how small of a distance naval ships need to travel to engage each other um, mm -hmm. means that you have a huge advantage for hitting feudal like 15 seconds before your opponent to get those initial ships over onto the fishing eco so i i do like the water rework i do like water maps in general um i also wish that they put continental into one yeah, of the so one of the pools just because I think it solves that issue. Uh, I think it's yeah. a much better Baltic because one, you don't have that huge advantage of getting to feudal age faster because the boats have to take such a long, uh, long travel time to get to your opponent. So there is a defender's advantage for uh -huh. the docks. The fishing eco is harder to raid. And then also the land game isn't split up into two like lanes. You can actually have a normal land game well, you've got the water game going on. I think, I think Continental is just a better version of Baltic. Um, but I'd like to play one, more one v ones on that match. Mm -hmm. On that map, um, I casted quite a few matches of that. It used to be, and I think the Rising Empires, Low Elo Legends. I think twenty six or one of those. It was one of the maps in the map pool, and we got a few good casts of that. And those games were hype every single time. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think Baltic enjoyers should start becoming continental enjoyers. Um, yeah. But Baltic as it stands with how much it depends on, can you instantly knock your opponent off of food eco? Uh, I, out of all the water maps that and Boulder Bay, uh, I really don't like uh, my vote is my vote is C tier for Baltic. All right, it's up to you, soccer uh, <laughs> Well, it's definitely not A for me. Sorry, Sir Nevels. I, I can't. I can't uh, like it. And, and, and even and I, and I agree with Beal's assessment too. Like, I, it's not just the fact that it's a water map. I don't feel like it's a well designed water map. Um, I think Continental is better. I will agree with him, but it's yeah, not a map. Well, I'll I will. I will. I'll be. I'll, I'll put it in B. Uh, it just depends. I think it man, needs to some, go some help. You gotta be nice, man. If you wanna go see, it's okay, man. I'll stay yeah, on top of it. We'll put it in C. You're, you're kind of on your own. You're kind of on your own there. It's, I just, <laughs> nice uh, water is, is good. It's better than it was. It just, yeah. Uh, it's, whoever wins water wins the game. And I, there's no, I think the map itself kind of lends it just being this big naval slog. And it's, it's just, yeah. I'm never, it's always going to be the first one I, I downvote. And it's not just because I don't like water maps. It's, I don't like this water map in particular. I think there are better options. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of yeah. better options, what, let's talk about Four Lakes. I love Four Lakes. That is I, I like a. this. I, I, I definitely like agree. S or A for me. I love um, Four Lakes. A. I think A is a good spot. It has, that, it has that wood Friday. in the middle. I don't, I don't love the wood in the middle as much. It's a bit, no, you're thinking of Forest Ponds. Oh, Forest Ponds. That's right. Four that's right. Lake. Does not actually does not have, 
wide open in the middle. That's right. That's right. Uh, and yeah, mm-hmm. this is this is definitely A tier for me. Oh, um, yeah. Four legs is good. I like the little islands we've got too on each of the corners. Oh, yeah. Dude, I've, I've been the second sites in the island. Yep. Yeah. A lot of uh, pro players don't like that. Uh, Cause what is the, see, this is Forest Ponds, but the, uh, the, what it's originally based off of was Four Lakes, the uh-huh. EGCT. The one in that one did not have the sacred sites. I think the water, I gotta honestly, I wanna bring up and see what the big difference is, but like, I think just the way it was positioned was actually a little bit different. Yeah, I believe that like in EGC, uh, there weren't those islands and there was a lot of stealth forest. In yeah, the, uh, in the center. Yeah. That was okay. a good map too. I like that too. That I like good, the multiple I mean, ponds. It's better than I mean, the EGC maps stay winning. Uh, like EGC maps, four lakes. Oh, there's so better much better. Than, both like normal four lakes and uh forest ponds it's like the developers being stubborn they're like no ours is better we can't we use theirs i know i don't know exactly. why they don't just like go <laughs> hey can we, can we just use your that. map or like that, that should be like a big badge of honor like credit to so and so it's yeah. in the game like that'd be yeah i don't the devs do seem a little protective of that but it's like come on like that was a, we know that they took this they saw that and we're like you know we like the concept, but we got to make it ours. It's like, okay, you can copy my homework. Just don't make it look like mine. That's- I know, listen, <laughs> yeah, let's, just call, let's just call it what it is, man. These these independent map developers are just killing it. They're doing better. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Like, let's be real. Like, respectfully, developers. These uh, these these uh, custom maps that are being modded in the game are even the Lippany one, the version of Lippany. Mm-hmm. We don't know that. That one is better spawns. But we're, yeah, we'll go, we get to that when we cross yeah. that bridge. All right, uh, French Pass. I think this one is. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, this is the get worst. Out map. Here. Get this, get, why is this in the game? Why oh, is this in the game? This this is just a worse all tie. There, I said it. This is a this is all yep. tie, but yeah. on its yeah. side. This is the stupidest map. All the gold in the middle. Yeah. It is. It takes forever. You know, this game. This would be a much better map if both of the town centers were on, both sibs were on the same side together. Like you, one core, other core. Interesting change. That yeah. would make yeah, this so much better. Um, because then you each kind of have your own little corner you can boom and build off of, but it's still on the open in the back. That would be a little better. This map, as it is, it is such a long way to go. I you can't even get to your opponent's base half the time, even as a sieve that rushes. Like I was saying, it's one of those maps where whoops, my army went the wrong way. Yeah, that that I agree with. That is, I agree with. I they this, I, I feel like when they did the patch, I think as a whole. This map pool is better than the last, but I think French Pass is where they kind of. This is the one I disagree with. I like. It's yeah. like they're like, yeah, let's go into this in the where, let's just just see yeah. what happens. And it's like, no, this map is just so inherently bad. I don't even mind the extra gold on the on the map in general. I don't like. I like that it's just strategically in the middle. The, the, it's the mountains. It's the mountains in the way that the two T sisters are just so far. It, this this mm-hmm. favors civs like China, uh, if C- okay. Abbasid. English. Uh, English, not, kind of, kind of. I feel like I don't know. Game. As an English, a late game maybe, but English, I like. Usually, if you're playing English, you're gonna go against like China or something, and you're oh, going yeah, yeah. against civs that want to boom. And frankly, English can't out boom China. No, and you're, you're right. always gonna go against a civ like that on this, and I. It's just a world of hurt. This this needs yeah. to be pulled. This is a bad map. Just and it's a bad map in general. Not even just for rank. I, agree. I don't know what it's like Thanks. on multiplayer. I don't know if that makes it better if it's bigger spaces. Team games, but... uh, I, I still don't like it. I've only played like a couple of team games on it, and it still runs okay. into that situation okay. of like, oh, army is just never in the right position. Yeah, this this is a, a worst map in the pool right now, hands down. They should put King of the Hill in instead. Yeah, oh, King, oh, King of the Hill is controversial, but at least it's more viable than uh, King. Controversial, and it's, it's interesting at least. Yeah, at least it's interesting. Like, I'll give it that. that. At least, at least there's some back and forth. I, I, I like that better than French Pass, at least. All right, uh, what is this? Uh, this is That's High View. View. High View. Yeah. What do we think about High View? I think B. I think I'd say, say A. I'd say it's oh, an a. a. I'll go A. I'll go A with B on that. What? Yeah. Oh, I like. I mean, I the fact that it's like an open map like dry arabia but it's kind of closed just because of all the stealth forests um i think it's a really interesting design yeah uh, and i do love the battles in the middle for both vision and also uh like just army and vision at the same time mm-hmm. i'm surprised uh, you don't like I, it sir because this I is a good map that. this is a good map for french because of how open it is 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'm getting I'm getting back on the French bandwagon. At first I was big in the Abbott. And I don't know, I'm not the biggest fan of Abbott on this map, but uh also it's a really good map for Roos. And I used to love Roos mm-hmm. on this map. And actually, now when you guys actually bring it up, I might I might sway towards A because um they need a patch. I don't know which one it was, but they made it to where scouts have more visibility in the self force. Uh-huh. And like it became a little bit better after that. So honestly, like if this game pops up, I'll probably throw probably get my roots a little more practice. But uh, yeah, I guess I guess a, I guess A is pretty good. Yeah, the I only thing that keeps me from right putting back. this, the only thing that keeps me from putting this in S tier is that uh, the sheep spawn on this map is atrocious. Uh, I'm terrible. I I never find sheep on this map. It's really frustrating to find where they are. Uh, the stealth mm-hmm. force kind of keep the sheep out of them more or less. It, it, it scouting is an absolute pain for sheep in this. So that's the only reason, yeah. my only dock against it, I think. Uh, besides that, I, it's definitely a map I'm never upset when I play on this map. It's not like I go, oh, no, hideout, or oh, no, French pass. Yeah. It's, it's oh, okay, high view, cool. Different type of dry Arabia. <laughs> All right. Most um, definitely better than that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Lipany. This is, this, this, baby. Is a, this is a map S that baby. is very interesting. A. S, baby. Bring it up top. Get it, give it the S. Let's go. Don't be afraid. A, a plus. A, a plus. <laughs> <laughs> so so we so Lipany is one of those maps where you either it's either a really good uh I, I I I lean towards S myself. I like it a lot. Um I might have to put this one in A or two. I, I don't know. No, don't cower, don't cower, man. You got it. I, 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 I do like this it. one. I'm gonna put it in S. However, I will Lipany say this this though there is a serious doc and it, it there is a very viable reason to say this is an A map instead. I will I will concede to be a little bit. Uh, you get a wonky spawn every now and then on this map, oh, and it yeah. is game breaking. However, uh, normally this map, I think this is the best map in a lot of ways because it's just so varied. You don't know. I like when you don't know what you're getting, and I almost, oh, yeah. I almost would like a, a mega random in ranked if it was balanced. If that makes sense, like a, a mirrored mega ma- mega random would be fun because I like. That's kind of how I feel about Lipany. It's like a no water mirrored mega random of sorts. Where it's kind of equal, uh, you don't know what you're getting. You always you have to scout because the seeds on this one vary so so much with where the cliffs and stuff are at. Uh, that's uh, that's why I said uh, EGCT. Uh, well, so they, uh, EGC TV they actually did like a mod on this map where the seeds were a lot more consistent and a lot better. And uh, you know somebody just uh, like an independent map maker, they just they develop a better Lipany, and it's way better. It's very hard to explain. I don't know exactly how to I, like say it specifically. I have mixed feelings on that one because I feel like it's not Lipany; it's Dry Arabia with Mole Hills. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> like I like, like it. Like, like Lipany. I do like Lipany. It is very seed dependent, though. It is. Um, I do like how. Right, the the routes to the enemy base are going to be different, and it does feel like every map that you play on Lipany is uh, more variable than like different games on any of the other maps. Like you can play two or three games on Lipany that are so different, but mm-hmm. like games on High View over and over are going to be kind of samey with how the map gens. Uh, same thing with Prairie or Hideout or something. Yeah, more French pass. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, I, I love Abbasid, so, you know, I'm going to automatically vote Lippany. The, the amount of Berry Bushes is so, so generous. Mm-hmm. We'll see. As an English it. player, I like it, too, because I can kind of, against an aggressive sib, I can hold off easier. And I also can still well, move out easily as well. Is there any sib bad on Lippany? I don't think so. That's man. why it's S tier, and that's why that's it's S tier. <laughs> that's why it's S tier, baby. There you go. Uh, all right. Uh, last one on our list here for our tier oh, list. Oh, the best. Mountain the clearing. Best. What do we? Th- there are some feisty opinions <laughs> on this map. Um, Thunderdome, my, baby. The Thunderdome. <laughs> Play alive on pay per view. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I like this map a lot. I'm not gonna lie. I don't Remind think I, can give, I can't give it S tier. Um, I no, can't I'm give joking. it S. No. But no, I do like I it. Give it an A or a B. Yeah, uh, A or B. What I've had fun with it. it. It is kind of one dimensional with, uh, yeah, you know, trying to establish like a defensive landmark in the center. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there, there's certainly play around that. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like it is a little bit more variable at the lower levels where higher tier players 
um, have a strategy and it all just comes down to, can you execute that strategy? Oh, you didn't. Okay. You lose. You lose. Yeah. I think we're, yeah, yeah. We're, we're all of us. We, we can all admit we're all kind of anywhere from gold to maybe mid plat. Uh, so I, we're at that level where you can use some of those high strategies, but at the same time, I think our execution isn't quite as uh, crisp. And so I think this map actually ends up being kind of a lot of fun. Uh, at least I, I have very much enjoyed this map and I really like this map on team games. A two V two on this map is a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. Team, team mountain clearing is so fun. Cause I think one of the be biggest problems too. with, it can be a bit, but I think the biggest problem with uh, most team games is that the map gets so big that it gets really hard to have fun feudal fights. Whereas I think a two V two mountain clearing is a fun feudal two V two. No, I agree. It cra- actually, you know what's thing that kind of surprised me about uh, mountain clearing actually the most? It's not as fun to watch as I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a, a lot of games in here are like, like, for example, one of the uh, Golden League 2 games, I don't know, uh, it was, I think it was BC Marine Lord. Like, the game was over in like, or maybe Lucifer and his brother, like, like Vortex. I think the game was over in like five. Like, oh, like yeah, five I remember days. that. Yeah. It's like, like, yeah, like if you like try to go for a strat, like a lot of guys, they'll go for like uh, some type of tower landmark or defensive landmark in the center of the map to kind of like immediately give them like kind of like Kremlin drop enemy. right on the sacred yeah, site. Yeah, Kremlin yeah. drop or a barbecue drop in the center. And like a lot of times, a lot of guys will go for that. And if you fail, it's game over pretty much like immediately. Like, it was a very interesting game between Marine Lord and Beastie where like they had a full blown villager fight in the center. That was pretty entertaining. It was a full blown villager fight in the center. I saw that. Because like one, one, one player is trying to get a, uh, their defensive landmark in the center up and the other one just rushed it with their veils and they literally were just like pulling out butter knives and just fighting. The center yeah, it was, that was wild. Whoa. I think it was, I think it was a Kremlin was versus good. England. Or no, it was not English. It was Kremlin versus, yeah. uh, or, Marine, Marine Lord, I think it was Malians. I think it was when Beastie was playing a lot of Malians, and uh, yeah, oh yeah, Marine Lord was pl- dropping the Kremlin down, and uh, yeah. he ended up killing just enough vills. I think, I think actually, I remember hearing that Beastie's computer actually crashed, uh, but he oh, conceded okay. it anyways because he already was kind of on the he kind of lost anyways. It was a little surprising yeah. when he it was like GG, and everyone was like, "Oh wow, that that was a little early," but he yeah. was kind of on the underhand compared to where uh, that Kremlin was at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a loose round vortex game where literally the game ended in like literally four minutes. I was like, all right, nah, nah, that's wild. It, it can't be. It can. It's a hit or miss, but it's a good map. I feel. All right. Well, that is our tier list. Uh, let me just read it for those at home listening. Uh, I will post this again. I, like I said, I'll have a post for this so you guys can see it. But just so you guys listening, you can get a recap. S tier, we have Dry Arabia, Lipany. Uh, a tier, we have what is this one called? Four Lakes. Forest Palm. Forest Palm. Four Lakes. No, that's four lakes. Four lakes. Oh man, I, I gotta mix it up. There's like so many versions of this, but you guys get the idea of it. Uh, then we have yeah. high view and then uh, not hideout, but mountain clearing. Then in our B tier, that's meh. We've got prairie. That's meh. Uh, down in C tier, not too great. Hideout and Baltic, although there is some protestation about Baltic uh, from <laughs> our Sir Neville's. Uh, not we don't hate water maps. We just don't like that water map in particular. And then agree, why yeah, is man. this map in the game? Why is French Pass? in the ranked 1v1 games yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, what yeah, is it yeah. doing? Or why is it even in the game? This is one of the worst maps. That's our I game. Um, we do, we are, this is going to be a long episode. Um, how are we doing on time, boys? Uh, personally, I'm good. good. I got like another uh, 45 minutes. Okay. Listen, I, don't have, okay. I don't have any friends. I got nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we, I, I guess we, I was debating if we wanted to do a, uh, a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like a, league 2v2 league recap uh, i don't we don't have a ton of time to do that and talk about the other maps as well and we were going to have a golden league recap too maybe we can just give you guys each like three minutes to give us a really brief uh mm, recap sure. of both of those uh, maybe start with beal with the 2v2 league and then sir neville's with a quick uh golden league recap yeah yeah uh sure um so the Rising Empires 2v2 League has kicked off. Uh, we've got week one basically in the bag at this point. Um, some high level names in Division One. Uh, a lot of three and O's in Division One. Now um, it's not best of threes for the series here. It's play all three. And in Division One, you get uh, five dollars for every map that you win. Um, mm-hmm. All going. All. Uh, it's play every map just um, like by the end of the season, it's easier to break out. Okay. What are the placements when you know how many maps 
or won and lost. Uh, but some highlights here uh, for this week in Division One: the Chimps, which is the Beastie and Marine Lord team. They 3 0'd Team AOE, that's Avely, Orc, and Elonia. They also 3 0'd Too Good with Wallalo, which is the Crackety and Lash team. Um, also, 3D, uh, the 3D clan has a team in this tourney. Uh, it's got B, Anatan, Dark, Kath, Pat, and Garnath. Um, really, teams can be between three and five players, so they're really filling out their roster there, but they, they won three and against the rising Germans. And they also won three and O against Imba. Another, uh, big name division one team, Casas K. uh, which is Vortex and Lucifron went three, and O against too good with Wallalo and three, and O against project conquerors and team snake, which is wham puppy paw and state. Went three and zero against Genesis Gaming and two and one against NSW. Oh, That's a team. got a two and one in there, huh? Took a win. Water, yeah. Uh, actually, Team NSW is the only team to split both of their series. There was a lot of three and O's in the first week, just because it was a lot of uh, the top tier versus the lower tiers um, in the first week. But games to catch over the coming next week. Uh, I would. I'd keep an eye out on Team Snake. That's Wham and Puppy Paw. Uh, they're going to be playing Chimps, uh, Beastie, and Marine Lord, as well as Casas K. Passan, uh, which is Vortex and Lucifron. So Team Snake has a bunch of difficult games in this upcoming week, but uh, big names in both of their series. Uh, so who do, you, who, who do we think out. is going to win that? I mean, Wham versus Wham and Puppy Pod on a team sounds scary, but with Marine Lord and BC too, ooh, that'll be that'll be. I'll have to check some of those out. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and Division Two also playing their first series this week. Uh, Division Two is actually split into two separate groups, and they're doing a round robin in each separate group. But uh, just games of note in uh, Group One. The team seven TC Giga Chads, three and O'd Vipers recruits, and the Real team went two and a, two and one against Devils. Um, Devils kind of a popular team. If you watch a bunch of streams, it's got Housed Horse, Jigglypuff, Laughing Fox in there. Uh, always like definitely a huge team. I, I am rooting for them to get the promotion. This season up to division one by the end of the season. Um, And in group two, FY God, three node, Ilalu Poggers and fresh noob stuff. One, two and one over the peacemakers and division three is going to start up this week. Uh, They're only doing six games before six series, excuse me, before the uh, playoffs at the end of the season. And that is the update. I know Rising Empires will do a quick overview uh, each week, a couple hours before the War Chief Club finals on Sunday each week. You're looking to check that out. And I know multiple casters are streaming the games during the week if you want to check that out. Fun stuff. All right. Thank you for that, Beal. And Sir Neville's, our final Golden League recap. Uh, we had the finals happened a little over a week ago now. Uh, do you want to go ahead and uh, give us on what the intel on what happened? Yes, sir. Don't mind if I do. Uh, like uh, it was a you know shorter week. It was a final, so it was only a total, I believe, of six players. And uh, so kicking it off uh, on the first on the Saturday of like last weekend, um, the uh, the Spanish brothers, Lucifer and Vortex, they went head to head, and Lucifer came out on top, beat his brother four two, and then a uh, second game uh, that. Saturday was Marine Lord versus Beastie. Pretty, uh, you know, pretty big rivalry. Everyone thinks those two are probably the best two in the game. And uh, surprisingly, BC came out on top. And I just came out on top, but he 4-0 Marine Lord. Marine Lord did not oh. win a single game. And that was for the semifinals. So then he, after that, it became the uh, third place tiebreaker versus uh, the two losers, which was Marine. Well, I don't know. We, it's a nice call them losers to two redemption players, uh, Marine Lord and Vortex. 
And uh, Marine Lore, uh, they started off uh, one and one, and Marine Lore ended up taking that off, taking off Vortex 2 1 to secure his spot at third place. Uh, one of a nice little chunk of change. And the very final, the finalist, which was a best of nine, uh, came in between, it came between Lucifron uh, and Beastie Cutie. And actually, Lucifron started off pretty strong. I think he started off three overs, Beastie. Uh-huh. looking kind of rough. For your boy there, but the, then out of nowhere, BC he really uh he put he put the clamps on. He stopped he stopped playing games, and BC ended up winning that series. Reverse sweeped them. Yep, went in a win the series three to five, and uh, it was a it was a good game. It was a lot of good games, but uh probably the biggest highlight uh, that took place from the whole event was um after the Lucifer and Vortex game, EGC TV announced uh, their next tournament. I believe it's taking place, I believe it's taking place in June. Believe in June. Wow, that's actually a lot sooner than uh, I thought. No, no. Excuse me. Actually, the qualifiers start in May. So actually, oh, wow. from May twentieth to June eighteenth, uh, they're coming out with the Elite Classics, and I believe the pretty much, pretty much the concept of this um, was like a lot of a very. I think any tournament, a lot of guys have faced credit. A lot of the audience doesn't really like watching too many mirror matches where. Mm-hmm. This one is uh, mirror matches are completely eliminated. There's, it's a 1v1 tournament and there is no mirrors and there's no water maps. No water maps. I guess I, I guess people that watch the game like water maps. Yeah, I guess I'm really a minority. But yeah, there's no water maps, no mirrors. And it's going to be like a, like a real classic, no gimmicky rules. It's going to be a classic AOE for land domination. And they, they're taking place from May 20th to June 18th, and, you know, all the big names are going to be there. It's a 1v1 tournament. And the prize pool is going to be a little bit smaller, actually pretty significantly smaller, but that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, Golden League 2 is $70,000. This one's going to be a total of $30,000. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, uh, you know. And I believe also, so I know EGC TV is also uh, hosting, like, a little show matches during the week to kind of, like, you know, keep everybody warmed up. Uh uh, right, I believe maybe Erica, what's today's date? A couple days here, yeah, about three days. They're going to be uh, they're they're hosting a show match, a spring show match series between uh, it's called the Battle of the Brothers, uh, Puppy Paw and Wham versus Lucifron and Vortex, a little two v two. That'd be pretty entertaining. Keep everybody going to like you know the big uh the big uh, six week delay of EGCT tournaments. But uh yeah, so we got the uh, elite classic to look to. But yeah, BC I'm taking the, the dub and going only two. Pretty ironic. He was the one who was complaining about it a lot, and he won. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's a wrap up on that. Nice. All right, I think we'll take a quick, quick break, and we'll be right back with our main discussion topic. Have you ever seen a knight in need? all alone on the battlefield with no one to call a friend? Well, morenights.com is here to help. We're not asking for your money, we're asking for your heart. Adopt a knight today and give them the home they deserve. These knights are warriors, they're brave, they're strong, and they need you. By adopting a knight from morenights.com, You'll be giving them a new lease on life. You'll be their companion, their confidant, and their battle buddy. So come on, give a knight a chance. Visit morenights.com and start the adoption process. Who knows, you might just find your new best friend. Adoptive parents of knights should keep their knights safe from harm, from hurtful things such as town center fire, cannon emplacements, spears, and archer pilings. All adoptions are final. Please handle your knights with care. Visit www.morenights.com for details. Morenights.com where knights become family. And we're back. All right, time to get to the meat and potatoes of our episode. And I say that slightly tongue in cheek. We've been going for like a half hour, an hour and a half almost. we got some time left, but we do want to kind of dive in a little more. We've been kind of dance, dancing around it. We talked a little bit about maps already with our game today. Uh, let's just dive in, right? What are the best and worst maps in the game? We kind of already said our best and worst from the ranked pool. 
Um, and moreover, not just like we can list a couple maps out of what are really good maps, what are some really bad maps, just kind of get ourselves grounded. But what we really mm -hmm. want to get to is what makes a good map and what kinds of maps do we want in the map pools moving forward? Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I mentioned this was this idea of this kind of came to my mind, this topic, uh, watching Blade decide he's doing a little tournament as well. Blade five, 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 five. Um, he was really picky about what maps he wanted no water on his maps but he wanted them to be not closed off he wanted open ish maps but he wanted them to be unique and fun still as well not just dry arabia uh so what do you guys think what makes a good map uh if i if i'm to start off me personally i think a good map is a map that majority of civilizations can be played on and there's room for comeback like i think for example, uh, a really good map, in my my opinion, it's not a map that is, you know, it's a map that is uh, created and hosted by ECTV. So it's a custom map, but I believe that Holy Island is a really good hybrid map. A lot of people aren't really big fans of water. I get it. A lot of people really are big fans of, you know, like, you know, because, but okay, point to make is that you if you lose water in holy island you still have you can't really win you can't you have to win through water there's land you can contest land and make a advantage I, if you watch egc tv and a lot of the big players play uh a lot of games like those are like probably some of the best games in the whole series where the maps on like more of the higher maps like golden heights holy island and I just feel that a map that majority of civs can play it on, Holy Island obviously has its favorite. Anytime you're water, you got your little favorite. But sometimes a player looks like they're behind and they can completely come back, which has been kind of a criticism by some casters that they, one cast in particular, I still forget his name, but uh, he said that he, one thing I don't like about spectating a map is that he feels that if a player is very far behind, there's no room for comeback. You pretty much just are waiting out for him to win. Whereas Holy Island, like, there's been plenty of games where players look like they're down and out and they still come back and they find a way to still win. So if you ask me the basic concepts of what makes a map decent is that most civs can be played on it and there's a room for comeback. What do you think, Bill? That's a pretty uh, decent uh, description of what makes a map good. Uh, I feel like when you when you talk about maps, there are just so many different categories of maps, uh -huh. um, and there's different I don't know different qualifications, a reason to make a map um, in one style versus another. Like I'd say you've got you've got your open maps like Dry Arabia or Basin. Um, you've got you've got closed maps um, like Hill and Dale or Altai. Uh, you've got like minor hybrid maps, like pond maps, like ancient spires or cauldron or dry river. Um, you got like bigger hybrids, um, like Baltic or Holy Islands, like that. And then you've got, I think I'd call them gimmick maps, like Oasis and King of the Hill. And I think you can make a good map, uh, in all of those different types. Uh, honestly, uh, it just comes down to like, uh, oh, what place that map is going to have in either a tournament or a ranked pool. Mm. Because you don't want to have a lot of gimmick maps in a tournament unless it's, you know, based around gimmicks. Um, it also comes down to, like, how well you can design for what a good water map should be. Because um, the criteria for that is certainly different than what a good land open land map should be mm. yeah um i know a lot of people so like kind of watching blade kind of decide maps he was very adamant he didn't want water because he just didn't want to deal with it i think that's that's his opinion that's fine i i sometimes agree with him personally sometimes i don't um but he really wanted open maps and i kind of get this consensus i think the most vocal people about maps uh if there's a segment of the population in this game in this community that is vocal about maps. They usually only like open maps. They seem to really dislike some of those more closed maps. They don't like when civs get kind of a free ticket to boom. Um, I kind of like, I think that kind of leans into what Sir Neville said. Like some civs just don't seem viable on those kind of maps because they can't boom as good as China can. 
Um, so then are especially like as far as like a ranked pool goes, are open maps kind of the only real way? As are do gimmicky maps even have a place in there or closed maps have a place? Or is that just part of the game and we just need to accept it and adjust our play style for it? I think it's part of the game. Um I think having King of the Hill in tournaments and ranked pool uh just to mix things up is certainly welcome. Um I don't know about Oasis. I don't think those games are as interesting as King Oasis is terrible. Game. Yeah, it's not my favorite <laughs> map. I don't like it. It's a little too gimmicky. Oasis is terrible. Uh but then you also have gimmick maps like jousting fields for two. I Prime like that great. one. Prime That's a good great. one. That's a really yeah. good map. Now now let's let's dive into this. I like this. What I mean, those are both for anyone who doesn't know what joust is. Imagine you have it's a two v two map, for instance, and uh, essentially there's a wood line that cuts it like it's an old split screen game, right? So you got up half, bottom half, and there's two players, two on the top, two in the bottom, and they're both opponents. So you got basically two one v ones going down, and then if one team wins both of them, then they win. If it's a one and one, then they kind of have to start finding a way to chop through, or they can chop through earlier if they really want. Uh, but it's basically you're jousting your first opponent and then you maybe have to fight your other opponent. Really cool map. And everyone knows everyone else should know what Oasis is as well. If you play this game. I think jousting fields is the single best team map. I, I'm very weird. My biggest pet peeve in team games is that I feel like even when I play, like if I'm in a chat, I'm like, all right, who's the weakest player? Let's double him. <laughs> Let's get him out of here. <laughs> so like jousting fields, even though it's possible, it's just if you do cut through your teammate, you're a delayed in your double team. Like m- most of the time it's a one V one. And you know, if you're, if your buddy's kind of selling you, he's kind of getting, he's kind of getting, get, getting out of there. Then you start chopping through like, I'm almost there. I got you, man. Don't no, a little longer. Like, you know, it's just, you know, I think Jocelyn Fields, once again, it's not a map that's created by the developers. It's a custom map. And I think a lot of times these custom maps really prevail in the end. It comes out of fun. Yeah, it's certainly a lot of fun to watch. Uh, oh, yeah. Too. I know yeah. some of the players aren't aren't super big on it just because, yeah, they are team players. And now you're just playing parallel <laughs> 1v1 until there's a chop through. Um, but I I really like it. I like the design. And I think it has a place with other gimmick maps in mm-hmm. tournament or ranked play. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a fun one. And it only really works for like 2v2 i guess you can maybe do it like for a 3v3 it's a it's a fun i like that map it's a fun thing to watch it's it's the kind of gimmick i think that works whereas like oasis is the kind of gimmick that doesn't Terrible. seem like it works right because you got like a wood Terrible. circle like a huge wood wall circle around a lake with secret sites in the middle it just feels bad everything about it just feels bad pro players ruined it they made it to where people know how to cut through a one villager to the center I just hate it. I'm just like, oh, they're like, I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing something smooth. I'm like, I'm finding the center. And he's already got a whole base in the center. I'm like, oh, OK, I'm a little late. Hey, how you doing? Like, it's just, yeah, I think Oasis is where gimmick these kind of gimmicks kind of go a little too far. Well, you know, I think that's kind of why like why Beal and I don't like Baltic as well. It's it's kind of a the mm. gimmick of water maps. If water maps are kind of gimmicky, you have to get to feudal and have a water presence before yeah. your opponent or you die. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean. Boulder Bay is an even worse version of yeah. Baltic because those ships yeah. are your docks are right next to each other. Yeah, dude, you're pretty much a neighbor. You like yeah. right next. Yeah, I like Baltic better than uh than Boulder Bay. Yeah, I like Nagari better than Mall, but Nagari seems a bit uh, better than all yeah. those. But. Hey, Phil, what do you say about you know the pathing of your units? Because that's Nagari for me. Like, oh, they're going that way. Oh, wait a minute, that's <laughs> Nagari. Yeah. That's Nagari for me. I'm yeah, like, no, what's Nagari's going on? not a great map. I just want to say I like it better I've than Baltic. A couple of times. Uh, yeah, Nagari's okay. I mean, water holes is a good. Um, yeah, I like water holes a little bit. Water is a good water map. I, I enjoy water holes, um, which is just a worse version than the EGC Kawasan, hmm. uh, which is basically two ponds that are of equal size right in the middle and in between the ponds is a giant berry patch. You, you hot know, take, you know hot take, takes. hot take guys. I love <laughs> water holes. I think it is the best water map in the game. Wait a minute. Let me make sure I'm looking at the right map here because I might uh, disagree with you. Okay. No water holes isn't bad. I thought you saying wetlands. I think wetlands no, no, is the no. worst. Wet, wet wetlands. Wetlands. Water holes okay. though. I water like it and I bad. like it for, good. I like it for a very interesting reason. I like it in a one V one. I like it also the way it scales in a 2v2 or bigger. I like yeah. the way it scales up and it adds more pawns like in a circle. 
I think that mm-hmm. is just so cool. I think it is a really cool because at first I was worried it would just be two larger pawns, and I would have liked that right. too. I think that would have been okay as well. But the fact that it did four, the way it, the way it scaled to me was it just felt so nicely balanced. I think that is one of the best scaling maps. And kind of on that, like one thing I want us to consider too is how do these maps? If you're building a map, how does how well do maps scale in this game? Like Dry Arabia scales really well, right? I mean, it's just flat, basic. Yeah. It scales as big as you want or as small as you want. But like Mountain Clearing, 1v1, very different from a 3v3. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think Mountain Clearing is even more fun in team games, for sure. Mountain Clearing is superior in team games, I feel. I agree with you on that one. Well, how I much? Listen. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. There, I'm just going to make a hot take. There's there's a... Literally, I think even the pros agree with this. There's only there's the biggest way they can fix the map pool in this game. The number one they can fix it is literally allow the tournament maps to be in the rank ladder. Mm-hmm. If developers did that, if they put the tournament maps in the rank ladder, the the ladder will be way more full of pros playing it. A lot of mm-hmm. pros do not play the rank ladder because of the map pool. Like that's why you you see like the guys that make money that do the job full time they play ladder you know like you know for example the Muslim and BC they play ladder just to kind of hold that standard of them being number one or two in the world but like you know like for example the best player arguably in the world does not play ladder like a lot of players do not play ladder because of the map pool if the if these you know these tournament maps went to the map pool like that would probably be the single best thing I could think of right now for the game. I'm telling you, these 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 custom games are just these custom maps. Excuse me, are just. So I mean, nothing against the developers. You know, they're doing their thing, but it's so much more far superior than the map pool we have in the rank ladder right now. I think if they start implementing, they put maybe put the eagle tuck it a little bit or whatever the reason is. I don't know. They figure out way behind that and start getting ranked maps in the ladder. The the game would the game would at least the pro scene. There'd be a lot more to watch and more going on mm. and a lot more competitive on the ladder. Well, a lot of those maps have a lot of things in common that we should probably look at too. Um, think of like, like riverbeds or like Canyon, some of those or the mm-hmm. Hill between us. They're all typically more, they're more open maps typically for yeah. one. So I do think there is kind of a preference in ranked settings or competitive settings for more open maps, but not, maybe not mm-hmm. like, like, Prairie, that's a little too open, I think, for most people. But yeah. there is some preference for some open maps. But I think the thing is, is, I mean, if we really wanted a perfect balanced gameplay, we would just play Dry Arabia every time. But again, it gets dull, right? We want some variation in our terrain. Yeah. We want some we want some strategic thought to go into what we're doing. Um, I think making interesting. Like, I don't think people like small, teeny choke points that are too easy to defend. But having points yeah. where you can defend or having points where you can send your army to a different place, I think those kind of considerations are what make maps interesting. And a lot of those maps, you look at them, they're open, but they have strategic points or like like those, uh, what is it? Is it riverbeds that have uh, the, the little ponds, the little shoreline fish like in the middle? Yeah, dry river. Dry uh, river. Yeah. Yep. That's a good, that's a good hybrid map because... You can dock it up, or you can just put a mill on it, or you can just ignore it, it and just go all in. It it's might be now dry river. There, there, there's I a couple remember. of varying maps all it's kind a of lie. Have it's different. A lie. It's very, it's very yeah. Creepy, yeah. There's a number of maps, and they all they all share kind of similar veins, though. In that, I mentioned too that I think a, a really good map would be just a balanced, a, a mirrored uh, mega random, where you have the exact same thing mm. on your side as your opponent has, but yeah. it's random every Ooh. time. Oh, yeah, that's some serious coding right there. Yeah, that'd be insane. I don't know how that would ever that'd be, that'd be insane. But I, I, Mega Random is one of my favorite ones to play, especially on big team games or like uh, Free For All Nomad is always on a Mega Random because it's just so fun just to explore and see. And it just it's wonky and messy and people just love that. Oh, yeah, I agree. I'm looking at this map pool right now. I know, then now we got to look at the map pool, kind of see what else. Yeah, I'm trying to um, think. I mean, honestly... EDC's doing their thing. Yeah. Water maps feel rough still to me. Like um, I think I think I think maps like like warring islands. I think that's where I draw the line of water maps. Like yeah. full so, water. Yeah, like full water. Like uh-huh. your islands. Like, never gonna play like, that room. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that was warring a Warring Islands or Archipelago. Big. Both of those maps are just yeah, complete yeah, garbage. Yep. So yeah, I think that's maps. what when I when I say water map, that's usually what I think. I think hybrid maps. Uh, and to be like, like watering holes is a hybrid map, I would say. Whereas I think of Baltic yeah. as a pure water map. Water maps like like Warring Islands, man, that's just 
ah, it just feels so bad because there's just no other, yeah. for me, there's no other avenue you can go. You are forced and pigeonholed into oh, just yeah. water. And I think that's what people don't like is it kind of it strips that choice up. Like with like four lakes, you get to choose what lake you want to go. And you still have mm-hmm. military on land you have to do. So there's a lot more decision. Whereas like a warring islands, I mean, build them a navy, Why, build it fast yeah. or you lose. And you and, and, and get landlocked. Like, uh-huh. if you, like, lose really bad, there's no way you can come back. Like, you, the enemy just takes over water, and you're stuck on your little island with your minimal resources, and the t- enemy just either gets a sacred site or just invades, and you're done. Like, there's nothing, there's really no way to come back. So, I think, I think those are bad water maps. Those are, like, full water maps, and I think those are bad. You know, I want to make a challenge where we try to make the worst map possible. You know, because sometimes, like, everyone's trying, to make, <laughs> everyone's trying to make the best map, right? What is the absolute worst map that's been made and crafted look like? I mean, what do we call it, like, Isthmus or something? Forest two, nothing. Two, forest nothing. <laughs> I mean, I, I, my, my, my current one is, like, Isthmus, where you have, like, just two, or Causeway, maybe. We have two massive water bodies of water. Each player has a third of the uh, like a top or a bottom strip of land. And you have this one little tiny strip of land that connects the two of them. And then two bodies of water like that basically. Or maybe like like a big like I don't know if I've been describing that really well, but imagine like one player up top, one player on the bottom, huge amount of water and one little strip of land that connects the two of them. <laughs> like that would be a terrible map, right? That'd be horrible. That'd be absolutely horrible. That would be absolutely horrible. That would never get picked. <laughs> what does Wait, the worst the map look like? Oh, like, like, are we talking about like what the worst map in the game is? Are we going to discuss that? Are we, uh, we, can, we can, we can. I mean, we kind of already hit on a couple. What, what do you, what do you think is the worst? Like, map? I'm, 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 I mean, Warring Islands Warring is pretty Islands? up there. Or, or, that or Archipelago. Oh, yeah. well, like, see, I like see me. I'm looking at either two that are, like very quick top of the list. I mean, the ones that are actually developed by the, the developers. Black Forest me was horrible. Oh, Black that, Forest is oh, bad. Yeah. Oh, man. Black That's so Forest bad, I didn't even think about Black Forest. Black Forest can never make a comeback ever, and then that map is horrible. And uh, just like we were talking off-camera, soccer, and, uh, yeah, outside. I hate outside. <laughs> I hate that. Maybe I'm biased because I do so bad no, outside. If they remove, just remove the trade posts from Altai, or instead of having them in the corners, they were, like, on the sides. On the sides? Yeah. Uh-huh. More risky, yeah. yeah. Uh, my thought on right. Altai, I was we were, we were going to talk about this on uh, Altai. I think the mountain chains are too long. I like the concept yes. of Altai a lot. Like I really, really like it. I think make the mountain chains begin after your town center. Like instead of reaching all mm. almost all the way to the back, have the mountain chains be smaller and then move those trade posts somewhere else. I think trade should be I like what we were mentioning earlier. Trade should be you get to go trade because you have map control or you're being yeah. really, really risky about it and hoping your opponent doesn't see it. Yeah. Um, I think that I think trade could be fixed by just moving trade posts uh, or putting them in more strategic locations that yeah. would be contested or, or areas where they can't go for quite the long distance. That actually makes lots of like just make it more punishable. That's probably the best way to like balance our trade. Just make it to where like if you put trade in such a safe spot and you just wall off and just go insane, you don't need map control. Then that's where trade goes a problem. But if you like say you put it somewhere where like you actually have to like really really highlight defending this trade i think comes a little bit better i i like where you're going with that yeah that's why mount that's why mountain pass is also terrible yeah that's why mountain pass is just so terrible yeah. trade is easily easy to block <laughs> and that map that, that map has so many problems that map's i hate that that map is rivaling that map rivals Alabama. for for our like, listeners if anyone pass. can come up with the worst map uh um, this is my <laughs> challenge to our listeners i want we will i will review this next episode too if if someone can make the worst map or the one I mentioned that I would think would be funny, uh, show it to me. Because making a good map, I actually uh, tried diving into the map maker this last week, two weeks in preparation for this episode. It is so hard. Uh, making oh, a no crafted doubt. map is is not too difficult. But the generated maps, you're basically got to be a coder. And I, I don't have the patience nor the time to delve into that that much. Because um, I had a couple ideas. I've got a couple ideas for like maybe like a mountain in the middle just a small mountain in the middle that kind of splits your army a little bit, but not as much as like a king of the hill. Like it's just a little impassable mountain in the middle that, and then like a, that draws like a little line between your two town centers a little bit. Like, I think a cool map like that, I think there's a lot of good map ideas. Uh, Golden Heights is a map. I think one of the best crafted maps or generated maps. I think I've seen um, mm. and a good hybrid map too, for that matter. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mentioned Golden Heights. Golden Heights is really good. It's fun to watch too. Yeah, I like, I like the town centers. I like maps that have the town centers close to each other, but also yeah, have other yeah. like ways you can wall it off or you can you can wall it off easily. But even though you're close, uh, 
because I mean, I think that's, I, I, I don't know, like on mountain on French pass, the way, the way your two town centers are on opposite sides of just oh, so terrible. far away. Terrible. And, and I again, mean, I don't know how some, some maps, you know, they scale better in multiplayer than in others, you know? Yeah. I, I think Hill and Dale is also something nice. I like Hill and Dale a lot too. Yeah. Hill and Dale on 1v1s. I, mean, I hate Hill and Dale on team games. I actually don't mind it as bad as some people really hate that. Cause it's easy yeah. to close off. I'm an HRE guy, so I like Hill and Dale on multiplayer because oh, there's yeah. a million relics and I get them all. Might be the best map, but that might be the best Ooh, map for HRE. Hill I don't know. Dale. For, for HRE, yeah, yeah on a team good. game, for sure. HRE, yeah. I thought you were just yeah, saying it was the best, best map no, just no, in general. That's, that's, that's a real hot take. I don't know about that, but it's uh, HRE for sure. Beal, if you had to make a map, what would it look like? A good map or a bad map? Uh, Give me both. Give me both. What would your bad map look like? <laughs> I don't know. It would just be me uh, trying to figure out how the Age of Empires 4 map maker works. Uh, <laughs> it's just weird. It's a, it's a lot more weird. difficult than uh, Age of Empires 2. What was the map you were uh, casting a while ago? One. That was you. You casted one that was like just all four. It was kind of like Black Forest, but different. Yeah, that's Forest Nothing. Yeah, uh, Forest Nothing. That was that was an awful map. Yeah. <laughs> nice joke map. Uh, I don't know. Uh, best map would. What do you? How do you improve on Fire Arabia? Uh, mm. Just a like, little more terrain, right? It's just more terrain somewhere. I don't know. Best map. It, it would need to incorporate some sort of gimmick. I'm not sure what it would what it would be yet. Um, but I'd love to. I'd love to give the map maker another shot and see if I could come up with with something. Um, I was trying to when I was hosting the Joust, the Griabara. I was thinking of like coming up with just a custom map with the joust itself uh yeah, but right. I, I i just bounced off of like with how hard the map maker is to use mm-hmm. uh nothing really came of it yeah i've, I've done that a couple of times too like i i can make a crafted map easily enough uh, i can mm-hmm. do that but that's not really something that it's the same map same seed every single time so you really gotta the, the true generated maps are the way to go i just it's so hard to code that so i absolute uh, tip of the hat to everyone out there listening who is a map crafter who can generate these maps, make the code for it. And it's, I'm sure if I had the time, I could do it. Problem is, I just don't have the time. <laughs> I, mean, I oh, don't yeah, have no, the no. force of will to do it. I really don't. I, I just think a, a open, I think it's a nice open map where the it's just literally just you across from your opponent, almost like jousting fields, but like one one, just you and your opponent across. I don't know why I like simplicity is key to me, and I probably. I, I like more aggressive series or open maps kind of I'm more of a favor of, but like that right there is like perfect to me hmm. for like almost like where it's generally like there is no seeds. It just, it spawns the same every time. Just one of those in the queue. Maybe think, that's a, that's a uh, maybe unpopular opinion. I think my favorite map is Lipany because I like how different it always feels. We were mm, kind of talking yeah. about that earlier. Like I think what I like about it is I like the difference in terrain and I like that every now and then there's a choke point. Uh, but I always have to scout. I can't just assume. I don't like maps where I know where my opponent is just by looking at the map. Like, I, I Obviously, you know where in general terms your opponent's going to be, but I don't like knowing the route right off the bat. I, I definitely feel like Lipany is one of my favorites because every time it feels different. I, I have to scout out and those those uh, plateaus are always so, so very different. I've never seen the same mm-hmm. or even similar uh generations of that map and i think that's why it's one of my favorites and i like iterations i like different iterations of it too kind of like the uh the tournament style lipany uh, even though I, I joke it's kind oh, of yeah. like just dry arabia with mole hills uh it is i think still more interesting than dry arabia because dry arabia to me is a little bit plain like it's it's a little oh, boring yeah. to me even though it is very balanced balance and just i think simplicity does not can be key it's very simple mm. that's why it's probably so popular well, do we have any other thoughts on any other maps, guys? Anything else we want to mention before we take another quick break for our, our sheeps? I think I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Well, if anyone, again, if anyone wants to make some maps uh, for us to, to rate, maybe send those on in. Or the worst map. I'd love to see the worst map made. That'd be fun. <laughs> All right, we'll be back with our extra sheeps right after this. Hi, Sockerton here again. Time for my uh, my bi-weekly shout out to everybody real quick again. Uh, just want to do some shout outs to both uh, Beal and Sir Neville's. They have been pretty awesome co-hosts on this podcast. Uh, 
just want to give another shout out. You guys should definitely follow uh, Sir Neville's YouTube, join the Griot Barra, and follow AOE Beal on Twitch. Uh, big shout out to those guys. Uh, they they are definitely stepping up their their game every single week, and I've been just very impressed as the guy kind of running the things in the background. Uh, just want to shout out my appreciation for them. And also to you, you guys listening. Um, we have hit, as of today, recording on the... Uh, I'm recording this right now on the 9th of April. Uh, and we're like just a couple views away from hitting 900 downloads total. Uh, and for only being around for two months now on this podcast, that's kind of huge. Uh, we're super stoked. I mean, this is only episode number four, so that means... Uh, it's been only eight weeks, so two months, and we've grown a lot. I definitely appreciate the the feedback. I definitely appreciate everyone who's had kind comments. Uh, I just just been really great to see. I'm glad everyone enjoys the podcast, and we will hopefully keep the content rolling. On that, uh, if you want to support the podcast, we do have a Patreon. We have a couple people who've already pledged some some little bit of money every month, and we greatly appreciate that. Uh, all funds that we receive are just going right back to the podcast. Uh, we have a goal to try and raise $100 just to cover the yearly cost to host the podcast. And then, of course, uh, we do invest uh, a lot of time into this. I've spent my entire Sunday evening re recording this, uh, editing this, getting this ready for you guys for this coming week. Uh, so all that extra funds that we get will just go right back into the podcast, hoping to make it even better for you guys. Uh, on that Patreon, I'd love to say I have tons and tons of uh, bonus content for you guys. I don't yet. Uh, I hopefully will try to do something. I, I'm debating what I want to do and what I could do. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of strapped for time, so I can't like really do many bonus episodes just yet. But I definitely am thinking about stuff like that. And hopefully in the future, we can uh, have more content, and more stuff for those who support the podcast. So definitely do that. If you have the ability to, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, besides that, I just want to do my weekly shout out to the Rising Empires as well. Um, they are a great tournament uh, group that you can join if you're looking for a tournament. If Even if you're bronze or if you're silver, if you're gold, plat, even if you're a really high level player, they have the War Chief Club. All that can be found on the Rising Empires Discord. They have weekly events and other uh, leagues and things going on constantly. So definitely check them out. And I'll shout out the Griot Barra again. If you're looking for something more casual just to hang out and play, uh, the Griot Barra is a, another Discord that is uh, actually created by our man, Sir Nevels, and it's been going strong. I highly recommend it, especially if you want to find teammates to play with. Uh, great place to do that or to scrimmage in some 1v1s. So check them out. Uh, join them. It, that's all that's free. And the Rising Empires is free as well, by the way. So definitely check them out. I think that's about it. Uh, shout out to everyone. Uh, across the world, uh, I, I just love seeing the map fill in, like I've said before in past episodes. Uh, Australia is still number two out there. You guys are just listening like crazy. A uh, number of other countries, the UK, another one I want to mention, you guys out there in the UK, and Sweden. This week, Sweden has had like a number of downloads that I, I'm just like, I don't know what it is about Sweden. Some, you guys in Stockholm are listening. Uh, I just, I really like your guys' flag. I just noticed it today as I was looking at the uh, the country. So shout out to you guys. But I mean, you guys are all across the world. And I do notice each and every single one of you guys. So appreciate it. And you guys have a wonderful rest of your episode. We'll be right back. Uh. And we're back for our final part of the episode. This is the part where we all each in turn give our extra sheep, our little tidbit that we learned or our tidbit that we just think is interesting or just something that we just want to share before we end today. Um, Sir Nevels, I see you've actually got a note on yours. Let's start with you today. All right, bet. Okay, so this is something that I realized we're, we're going back to hybrid water maps here because I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm a fan of them. You know what I'm saying? I'm a minority, but... Okay, so I've always mentioned, uh, you know, the civilizations I believe are really good on, on water maps or hybrid maps are like, you know, your typical Rus, English, China, HRE. But another civilization that I, I think is actually really good on water, just because how you could, how you could kind of age up and kind of spread your village, put your more villages on wood. I believe that the Ottomans are really good on water, too. I okay. Now this is the build I go for because I tried it out and it actually worked out pretty good for me. This is the build I went for for Ottomans on water. What I did, so I just you know the typical you know five it was just the wood and one sheep and you know me try to build a dock. 
you know, that's a pretty typical way of doing it. But when I aged up, usually people go up with the um, uh, twin mirrored madras or, the, you know, the berry, the berry landmark. Uh-huh. Usually people go up with that. But instead, what I did, and this wasn't like 100% original. I think I, I forgot who I seen do it, but they did this. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, I went up with the Sultani Trade Network and I took all of my veils off of gold at that point. Put, took them all off gold, also put them on wood. So now I didn't, I, my, I could, I didn't spread my villagers out as much. So then once I got it up, I used a little hotkey to make it to where when I spawned in, in case who doesn't know, the uh, Sultani Trade Network, it, if you spawn, if you garrison traders in there, it will passively generate gold so how i aged up passively i just with all the wood i had coming in i just once i got enough like i could make i had so much wood coming in that i was making uh you know warships at the same time as i can garrison up my traders so i had six traders in my sultani trade network just generating generating gold i think it adds up to like 128 gold a minute after a certain point might have gotten nerfed. I don't know 100%. But it, I was passive generating gold, which helped to my age up. And I can also put more villagers. I had to worry about spreading out to gold. Put them all on wood. So before I knew it, I was able to... I had a lot of food, a lot of fishing food going coming in. And I had a lot of military ships out on the field. And I still was able, with all the food coming in through my fishing ships and the passive gold coming in, I hit Castle while having all this, like, way before my opponent. And I still had a bunch of Navy out there and fishing ships. And I just basically, what my sheep is, the Sultani Trade Network, if I'm saying that right, is, I think, very viable on hybrid maps because you can garrison up your traders and passive generate gold rather than having those three, four traders you had on gold. You can take them off and just put them on wood. And, you know, and you don't need, you don't, after a while, you don't need any of your sheep either because you got all your food coming in through the water. So I believe that the value of Sultani Trade Network on water, I believe, is good for the Ottomans. So I think Ottomans are also a very good civilization for water. That's interesting. That's definitely off meta from what we've seen from a lot of the things. I'll have to try that out for myself. It's not bad. It's not bad, man. I'm telling you. It actually, it'll, it'll surprise you. You're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm already, oh, I'm good. I'm already ready to go to Castle. If you protect your fishing ships. Maybe Beale yeah, should try know. that too and report yeah. back and see as the resident Ottoman's that main. Baltic. Like on Baltic, uh, good. his favorite map, you know. Yeah, your favorite map, <laughs> dude. Give it a shot. Give it a yeah, shot. Why not? Have some fun with it. <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, I think Beal, I'll head to you next for the extra sheep. Yeah. Uh, just something I noticed while casting the low elo tournament earlier this week. Um, just the fact that sometimes with an Aachen Chapel, uh, you don't need to really get all of the resources in range. Uh, I saw. One of the players play uh, dropped an Aachen into what I thought was like the middle of nowhere. The awkward and chapel, was, we called it. We called yeah. it the awkward chapel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was really confused over over why he did that, especially going against Brent, uh, the French uh, with the knights coming in. But he was actually able he knew how many farms could be within uh, the. The range of the benefit of the Aachen chapel. And built a bunch of farms, just basically boxed in the Aachen and farms and had amazing food eco from the rest of the game forward after that, uh, where knights really struggled to actually get in and raid. Um, so, yeah, uh, there is a benefit to, to putting your Aachen chapel in a weird spot if you're able to get a bunch of early wood and just jumpstart a farm transition underneath the hawk and it can definitely pay off yeah shout out to helios mm-hmm. i think who was the one playing as uh the hre with that i think that was him helios mm-hmm. uh who did that and we, we really we really gave him a lot of flack when like that is a weird hawk it was just next to the gold off the side of the map nothing else uh the awkward chapel that eventually grew up to be an amazing uh boon for him and he ended up just surviving the push and then overwhelmed his opponent it was really that was a good game all right i guess yeah, that leaves. Really uh, i guess it leaves just me with the extra sheep huh um so i have been watching i i just 
it just kind of works out that when I get home from work, normally uh, if it's not if the AOE Beetle here isn't playing on streaming, uh, Blade five 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 tends to be the streamer who's just on when I get home. So I mentioned him a lot because he's kind of the first streamer I see when I get home. Being on the West Coast here, I get off kind of late. Uh, he's kind of that window before I get home, like when I get home and then before I hop onto stream. So I usually watch him and he was playing this game mode that I thought was so fun. He's been doing a lot of Nomad FFAs. Uh, this one was probably the most interesting that I had seen in a while. And it made me I actually downloaded the mod for this. Um, basically, it's a regicide. Now, they're in the current game. There is no, I think, official regicide. In old AoE 2, there is. Essentially, how the game mode works is your king, you have a king as a unit. Uh, you got to keep him safe. And when he dies, you lose. You can lose all your landmarks, everything else. The king is what matters most. And uh, it just was such a fun game mode that I actually downloaded. The, uh, the mod for this that uh, they used was called uh, Outback Octagon 2, I think. And the tricky thing is, okay, the game could go on forever on a big 8v8 or 8 on for 8 free for all, right? The game could go on just ages, but the king actually has an ability. You pop him out and you hit R and it actually reveals the locations of all the other kings for a moment for a couple seconds. So you can always kind of find out where they are. Uh, it's just kind of a different take on the game. I think you can also build a wonder. I think that's also allowed. So that's the two game modes are either wonder or build a king or save your king and kill all the other kings out. And the fun thing about this is that every time you killed a person's king, you got an additional population space. So uh, normally 200 is kind of the hard cap on population, right? So you kill on a person's king uh, that gives you, I think it was plus 40 or 50 uh, units that you can then uh, increase your population to. So instead of being capped at 200, you could be capped at 250. And I thought as a game mode, that was so cool uh that that's kind of the, the playing with the population cap space uh i think was what made that mode so enticing to me because that kind of encourages some aggression in the feudal age instead of just going straight up to imperial uh you'd be at a better better advantage being a bit more aggressive uh then again if you can hold off and build a wonder or just kill one opponent uh you could still hold on that way but i, I just think it was a fun game mode and i would love to see like more content about that so i'm i'm thinking about maybe doing something for it maybe one day if i'm not busy uh just a really fun game mode again i think it was like outback octagon um uh, don't i tried playing it with the ai and the ai didn't really take care of its king so most of the so so it was like i, I put i mixed in like a bunch of the hard ai uh the hardest ais and like one intermediate ai and believe it or not it came down to just me and the intermediate ai and i was looking around for ages trying i was just playing just just on my own, you know, single players. So it's all just computer players. I'm stomping them all, you know, because they're easy. The, the hardest AIs just kept throwing their kings in fights and losing them. And I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, then the, the intermediate AI, though, was the last one standing. And I literally owned the map. I was looking everywhere for it. I started out in the bottom corner and I was just looking everywhere. I like could not find him using the ability. I just couldn't find him on the map. Uh, he had no town center. I couldn't find where it was blue. I could not find blue anywhere. I had like no idea where he was. My, I had units all across the map scouting. I was like, where is this guy? I ended up building a wonder in the back corner and a couple of keeps. And then suddenly his king must have died. I won. So I went back and watched the replay. And I found out that his king was in my base in the very bottom corner where I built my wonder. And <laughs> just sitting there like the entire game. I was like, oh my gosh, I spent like 20 minutes looking for him because I didn't want to actually quit. I wanted to actually win it. Uh, the, so the AI does not know how to play this game mode. So I'm really interested yeah. in playing this game mode with real people who know how to protect their king. Uh, cause it was a lot of fun watching blade play it. And I'm definitely, I, I problem is I can't play with blade cause he's far too good. I need to get like maybe on the degree at Barra, uh, some guys together who want to play this mode and get a game going. Cause it's, it's a lot of fun to play and watch. So that Got was a game with us, man. We always run FFAs. Got a game with us. Yeah. I, I need to, I need to, uh, but yeah, that was my extra sheep. The regicide in particular. A really fun way to do a nomad. Nice. That does sound fun. All right. Well, we have hit right around right around two hours uh, for this episode. Back on the saddle for big ones here. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, it's been a good one, guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Had a lot of fun. Happy Easter, everyone. Good discussion. Oh, yeah. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. All right. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, make sure you guys send us your worst maps. I want to see them. Mm-hmm. <laughs>